Greetings from Louisiana, proud home of the LSU Fighting Tigers National Championship football team. And if this COVID thing doesn't clear up pretty soon, they may be able to enjoy that championship for another year. I'm Tom Cockwood. I'm a dentist in Shreveport, Louisiana. I've been practicing since 1970. I've been asked to put together this series of videos to share our story, the personal story of what we've done in our practice, uh, especially during the last 20 years. In about 1976, I began to get interested in what people did with their teeth at night, grinding their teeth at night, a little bit about how the nervous system was involved with that, but we didn't know anything about sleep or breathing, really. Uh, later, later in the 90s, we became aware of obstructive sleep apnea and then other sleep problems. And or if, you, if you look at that picture up above there, that's a black hole. That's a giant black hole of the lack of knowledge we had. Once we realized so many of our patients, who were our dental patients, who had trusted us for so many years to take care of themselves, they were suffering night and day from disordered breathing. Uh, we're having nobody help them with it. And we had never helped them because we didn't know what to look for. We didn't know how to look at them. We didn't know what questions to ask. Once we had those questions, we didn't know what their problems were or how to treat them. So that has been a huge black hole. And for the last 20 years, specifically the last 10 years, we've made quite a journey to the point where we still fix teeth from time to time in our office. But our main focus is what we call airway centered dentistry. And so I've been asked to tell this story, uh, the story of how I got there, the great teachers I had who helped me learn, uh, books that you need to read, how you need to educate yourself, a uh, story of how we then began to develop different ways as the technology became available to diagnose and treat people with breathing problems, uh, how I treated myself and cured a lifetime of chronic inflammatory disease at age 68 with oral appliances that I was told could not possibly work, uh, how we've applied these things along with myofunctional therapy and breathing technique to treating so many patients uh, with what we believe are is a high degree of success. So we've been asked to tell those stories and we will do it in three videos. I wish this were something that we could do in a big hurry, but this is the story of a 20 year journey. And so bear with me. I have a lot more to cover than we possibly can. So we may go through the slides a little faster than you'd like. But remember, if you're watching this, you have a, a pause button. So you can pause when you get to a slide and look at it uh, because this is an awful lot of information to try to absorb in a very small period of time. So I had to ask for an awful lot of help along the way uh, so that we could help people. And uh, we've been blessed by some of the world's greatest teachers who've really helped us understand what we truly believe now is the future of healthcare. The lines between med medicine and dentistry are evaporating uh, because we now as dentists are able to work with a team to help patients get well in ways their doctors can't or won't. So this is an exciting time and it is the future of our profession. So forgive me if I read my introduction to you. I'm Tom Cockert from Shreveport, and I'm now beginning my 50th year of practice, the last 20 of which are now focused on airway-centered dentistry involving an interdisciplinary team. The big change in our practice philosophy and protocols is the result of our having learned the truth about everyone who seeks our care, dental care or otherwise. That essential truth is that unless our patients are able to breathe functionally, from their noses to their diaphragms and back through their noses, they will not be able to achieve either optimal oral health or optimal total bodily health. They're all interrelated. 
Today, working as a team, those of us in dentistry and our allied members can now help promote and achieve wellness as a result of functional breathing for our patients, our families, and our friends in ways their physicians either can't or won't. These are significant, terrifying, and promising times in the realm of what happens when we can't breathe properly here in the midst of the epidemic, not only of breathing disorders in general, but of the COVID pandemic. Shit. Forgive the interruption, but even though our office is closed, somebody just rang our doorbell. Life is full of little, little uh, interruptions. So back to the introduction. Our profession, our dental profession, is leading the movement to change what, what is currently a broken sick care system, which is based on the management of symptoms, to a much more sensible, preventable, and corrective system of true health care by identifying, addressing, and eliminating the cause of those symptoms. Both in dentistry and medicine for years, we've looked at the problem and tried to fix it, uh, either by fixing the tooth, doing some procedure, or giving them some medicine. But all we've done is manage the symptoms. We didn't look at the cause to try to figure out why does the patient have these problems? What can we do to prevent it? and how can we fix it so it doesn't happen again. I've been asked to create this series of videos to recount our decades long journey of discovery in order to share our experience with you in order to help you along your own personal journey of discovery and enlightenment. These videos will tell stories. First, the story of how I was able to reverse many of my own lifelong chronic inflammatory disease processes beginning at age 68 by applying to myself the principles and techniques discussed in these videos. We will also attempt to explain why and how disordered breathing has become the number one public health problem in the United States and other developed countries. And that's why the current Congress who's asked me to give this program is international. This is a world health care problem. And finally, we will show documented case history stories of those we have helped to take what we call the walk to wellness, using our new practice philosophies and protocols. If you're watching these, you are already steps ahead of your peers and colleagues on the road to enlightenment that will help you achieve your true role as a healthcare provider. I hope you will enjoy these presentations and perhaps find them useful. You can tell by my outfit that I'm a huge LSU football fan. So today I am outfitted as your offensive coordinator and your efforts to learn to work as part of a team to provide optimal health care for yourself and those who seek your care and guidance. All right, let's start looking at many, many images. As I said, I, was, I had to ask for help and I still need help because there's so much we don't know. That's the point of this Congress is for so many of us to show know so that we can move forward, unified to help healthcare in the world. So I'm saying help because I got sucked into this black hole, a black hole of ignorance about why dentists need to understand how we breathe. I've been, after 20 years, I'm still trying to emerge with knowledge and practices that will help our patients, ourselves, our families, and our friends. Here are some stories from this 20-year expedition into the unknown. And naturally, that we're going to have to have some philosophy that, that talks about what's going on these days. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived this is to have succeeded. 
So these are terrifying times for those with disordered breathing. Here is a patient struggling with COVID on a respirator and who might have very well been on a CPAP before contracting with COVID because so many of us have breathing problems. Those with disordered breathing, that's most of us. Half of everyone we see has a serious issue, largely undiagnosed and untreated. It almost reminds me of, of that old ad, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Our entire population has fallen into the issue of disordered breathing and we're not getting better because that's our role today is to try to help with these things. And the biggest problem, here's Kevin, Kevin Boyd's great slide, shows this young girl, mouth breather, tonsils and adenoids all swollen because all of those noxious materials are going in through her mouth and not through her nose. And so she's sick because she's a mouth breather. This is pretty much the basis for everything we're gonna look at. If you look in the upper right side, that's Sandra Kahn. Sandra took these pictures at Disneyland, I believe, years ago. And if you look at them, they're all very young people. They're all very young people. They've all got facial development problems. Many of them look sick. If you look at this little girl down here at the bottom, that is a sick child. And all these people are breathing through their mouths. This is so typical of what the big problems are today. Sandra and Paul Ehrlich wrote this wonderful book, Jaws, The Story of a Hidden Epidemic, in which they say everything in the face needs its own place in space. That's a great rhyme that should be our mantra, especially from the moment a child is born throughout their lives. If we look at their faces, everything needs to be where it belongs. If it's not, they've probably got a breathing problem and we'll show how we can tell this just by looking at folks so that we can say, hey, do you know, I bet you have these problems. Maybe we can help you. And then maybe we can help them. This is our new destiny. They say in the book, it is our hope that recognizing facial deformity as a preventable condition will lead to a socioeconomic movement to change that environment to prevent the condition. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Especially, especially important today during the COVID, it's, maybe it's time, we've been talking about nitric oxide for years and half, you keep your mouth shut, you breathe through your nose, you're gonna inhale nitric oxide that not only delivers a lot better oxygen to your tissues and your body and your brain, but it also is a bug killer 200 times as strong as it needs to be to kill any bad pathogen we inhale through our nose. The early thoughts about what can we treat COVID with? Well, what if we breathe some nitric oxide? Well, <clears throat> what if we've been breathing nitric oxide all our lives with our mouths closed? Or if we decide that's what we need to do now? Medicine and, and our president are looking for answers. This is the answer, and dentistry is leading. Now here's Dr. Seaman running for, getting ready to, to train for a marathon, and he's got his mouth taped shut because he's realized he does a hell of a lot better with his mouth closed. He doesn't get winded, he doesn't get overexerted, and he has much more stamina. When we first started talking about mouth taping, uh, we were told it was the most barbaric idea I ever heard, and it sounds pretty scary, but if your mouth is closed, you're either going to breathe through your ears or you're going to die, or you're going to breathe through your nose. So this is a hell of a good way to find out if we can breathe through our nose, and if we can, it's a hell of a good way to make sure we can keep, keep on breathing through, breathing through our noses, especially when we're asleep. So here's the thought about the COVID thing. Uh, this may sound kind of kind of disheartening, but anthropologically, this is natural selection at work. A novel virus, these bugs that, are, that we catch and inhale aerosol droplets, they are predatory pack animals. 
They're seeking prey, just like cheetahs and wolves. And what do the cheetahs and wolves do? They all want to catch, kill, and consume the slowest and weakest individuals in the herd. That's what they start with because they're the easiest ones to chase down and kill. Well, that's what's happening to us now. In this pandemic, in this pandemic, Homo sapiens is the herd under attack. I looked on the internet <clears throat> to see what people who died from COVID look like. What do their faces look like? And so this is a montage of some of the first thousand people who died from COVID in the United States. And if you look, you will see that regardless of race, gender, age, or BMI, they have many facial and postural features in common, all of which led to the susceptibility of the illness that killed them. Can you spot these things? This is part of how we're going to help people. We ought to be able to look at them and know they're sick. Their physicians and dentists, perhaps, if it had taken a better look at them when they were young kids, maybe they'd be alive today. Look at these people. Some wonderful faces, some great people, some people who made huge contributions in this country, some people who are just ordinary people. On the upper right side is John Prine, my favorite songwriter, who said, blow up your TV, throw away your paper, move to the country, get you home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, try and find Jesus on your own, which is good advice for today while we're isolating. Below that are couples and family members, all of whom died from the COVID. And at the very bottom is John Glenn and his wife, and John Glenn's wife died from COVID. And if you look at her face, even though she's an elegant old lady, she struggled to breathe her whole life. Everybody you see on the, in that montage struggled to breathe their entire lives. They all have long faces. They've all got problems with the development of their airway and their maxilla. And I swear they're all mouth breathers. So this is something we should look at and pay attention to so that we can keep the people we know from ending up on a page like this. James Nestor, deep diver, had breathing problems. I wanted to figure out why he was sick. He's a journalist. He asked doctors, does it matter how you breathe? No, breathing through your nose, breathing through your mouth, breathing through a CPAP, it's all the same thing. He was smart enough to realize that can't possibly be true and incidentally has pursued the same quest as most of us in this movement as far as the sources we look for, the people we learn from, what we learned, and how we ended up treating ourselves. And so he's written this wonderful book, Breath, the New Science of a Lost Art. And I think this may have a lot to do with raising public awareness because only when public, when every mother, grandmother, and wife in the United States and around the world is able to look at their husband, child, brother, son, daughter-in-law and say, boy, you got a breathing problem. That's when the public is, demand, is going to demand that both dentistry and medicine know these things and, and adopt, get rid of our old orthodoxies, adopt new ways of thinking, new ways of helping people so that we can actually have health care in this country based on functional nasodiaphragmatic breathing. So what's today's new idea? It's not just about sleep. What got us into all of this was sleep, dental sleep medicine. Uh, my first exposure was treating fat old men with obstructive sleep apnea. Dentistry got into the world of breathing through the back door by treating people with the end stage disorder of obstructive sleep apnea. And then we learned from the back to the beginning that it's a lifetime continuum beginning at or before birth and that early is the best time to diagnose and treat. So it's about bad breathing. It's about 
bad development and the result of bad development, but it's not just about sleep. That's an outdated concept. It's all about the tongue and the nose, and it's all about how they work with the diaphragm, which is the pump for the lymphatic system. If we breathe through our nose, because our tongue lets us do it, then we're gonna breathe through our diaphragm, we're gonna have oxygen in our bloodstream, we're not gonna get sick, and if we do get sick, because we're using our diaphragm, our lymphatic system works and we're gonna get better quickly. That's the simple egg, eggshell thumbnail description of what we're gonna talk about today in its simplest possible terms. It's all about, it's about how all of these structures, not just the lungs, it's about how all of these structures develop and how they behave in harmony to promote function and behavior, not just at night, but 24 7, 365. We need to expand our thinking beyond bad breathing during sleep. Let's identify it and fix it. Yes, it'll keep people alive. No, it won't make them better. No, it won't necessarily extend their lives. No, it may not really help improve their quality of life, all of which can be accomplished by identifying and correcting these problems. And once we've seen that, how can we not see it? We've always needed a good term for all these structures that have to work together, and our good friend Kevin Boyd has come up with it. The Cranio-Facial Respiratory Complex, CRFC. We can use four letters to, in, to describe every structure we're talking about. It's brilliant. And here you can see he's illustrated it both in the infant and then in a properly developed adult. So we'll be using this term a lot. We need to expand beyond our dental view of just looking, in the, looking at the teeth. We also need to look at the tongue. We need to look at, see if the tongue is, is uh, keeping the patient from functioning properly. And we need to back up and look at their faces and we especially need to look at their eyes. If you look at this young man, he's got a restricted tongue, he can't breathe, he never has had any wear on his teeth because he can't clench or brux. He doesn't have obstructive sleep apnea, but he's on adrenaline 24 hours a day and he's totally worn out. If you look at his eyes, you can see it. My classmate Ron Perkins from Baylor 1970, an orthodontist in Dallas who's been growing faces and airways for kids for 50 years while his peers have criticized him for doing so. Ron told, told me two things that are important. Number one, follow the symptoms if you're helping somebody. Make an inventory of everything that's wrong with them so that you can see what improves as the treatment goes along. And before you do anything, look at their eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul, and you'll know immediately whether this person is sick or not by looking at their eyes. So here we have a dental visit where we're looking at a mouth, but we're also looking inward at the tongue, and we're looking at the eyes. And before we do any measurement, we know this is a sick person who needs our help, if they'll let us help them. We need to look beyond the mouth. We need cone beam CT scans so we can take a look at their tongue, look at their oropharyngeal airway, Look at, uh, look at their nasal airway, look for any signs of obstruction or lack of muscle tone or tumors or anything that might keep them from breathing correctly. And <clears throat> uh, don't, you might wanna look at this for a while. I'm not gonna talk about it too much. As we've gone along, we've learned to take photographs of every new patient doing many different things, document those photographs and put them onto a PowerPoint, which is sure beats writing down a lot of information. So we can go back and look to it, look at it, and then add in our inventory of symptoms. In the middle, our sleep image, which is a good snapshot of what goes on at night when they're sleeping. On the right side, pulse oximetry, which is a good snapshot of what their oxygen saturation and their pulse rate is doing all night. We can make good diagnostic casts and not trim them so that we can see things we never looked before when we were just looking at teeth. And we can get a good three-dimensional cone beam CT look 
at the airway. And if we have all this information, this is all just coming to a diagnosis. My father used to say the diagnosis is the hard part. You can look up the treatment in Reader's Digest. So the most information we can get in our diagnostic procedures, the easier it is to, to rule out the unlikely. And then when you're old and tired and got a worn out mind like mine, you don't have to remember anything because this is all in the computer and it's all in their files. So this is just how we've learned to do it specifically in the last couple of years. It takes a little while up front the day you see the patient, but it sure keeps you from having to try to remember and try to find things that you wrote down. So one of the, one of the effort, one of the tools we use is this camera, excuse me, is this camera application because all these patients have, everybody pretty much has a, a, a face that's not symmetrical. And part of our diagnosis is to see which side of that patient's face and airway, which side of their CRFC is underdeveloped so that we can understand where we need to apply forces to perhaps restore this. And so if you, on these pictures of all of whom are airway patients, if you look at the picture on the left side, that's just a straight on photograph of the patient. This chimera application will then split it into the same old trick you did when you're in the Cub Scouts and you took a picture of yourself and held a mirror over half of it so you were looking at a duplicate of one side of your face and you went, damn, that doesn't look like me. It's because we're asymmetric. And this shows it. So the, if you look at the top series of pictures, top left, on the left, is this young doctor's face. In the middle is what it would look like if, if his left side had developed his face. If you look on the right side, if you put together the right side of his face, that's what it looks like. So it lets us know that the left side of that patient's face in CRFC is underdeveloped. And you can draw the same conclusions on all these patients. So we can get all of this just from the uh, photograph we take at the patient's first visit and spend about two minutes on the computer making this image. So it's really important that we look at faces. We're gonna spend most of our time today on this particular video talking about faces and specifically, this is my face before I treated myself. I'm 68 years old and I'm a sick man. And I'm sick because I never have breathed correctly and none of these structures of my CRFC work correctly. Then after I was treated, if you look at that nasal capsule in the maxilla, there's significant change there at age 68. And so it all starts with looking at the face, then looking behind the face at the structures. And then once we treat the patient, see if we get changes in both the face and then in, in the bony structure that supports it. It's all part of telling whether or not we're getting success along with, maintain, with maintaining an inventory of the patient's symptoms. Because really, regardless of all the things we can measure, the gold standard of outcomes is, hey, how do you look? How do you feel? How are you doing? So these are just ways of measuring all of that. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment, just to take a breath and think about what's next. Okay, thanks for the little break. I've been uh, showing slides. First, went to Mexico once to lecture and I had two foot lockers full of slides. Now you can put the whole thing in a, in a uh, flash drive and stick it in your pocket. But it is still a problem remembering everything that's on that flash drive. And when you're standing up talking to an audience, you have a certain amount of leeway. Uh, this is my first experience ever trying to do a video. So put up with me while I try to learn the rigors of yet another learning curve for a tired old brain. Uh, so I have to stop from time to time and see what we're gonna talk about next. So this is what we're gonna talk about next. We said it's not just about sleep. It is definitely about sleep, 
Sleep is incredibly important. You know? Did I start recording again? Let me make sure. I don't want to mess this up. Okay, we're recording. Just wanted to make sure. It's not just about breathing 24 hours a day. It's very critical to sleep. If we don't sleep well, nothing goes right. But it just the, the important thing is that people who can't breathe at night can't breathe during the daytime. We'll talk about that later. Because it makes more sense to treat something 24 hours a day than just a third of your lifetime. But it's extremely critical that our brain get what it needs during sleep. And we have to complete a number of sleep cycles every night to have restorative sleep. If we don't, then the HPA axis gets activated, our hypothalamus, hypothalamus pituitary gland, uh, and adrenal glands just go to town all night when we're sleeping when they shouldn't be working at all. It's our response to stress and it creates stress. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. So we have to complete sleep cycles in order to survive. And one of the most important reasons for this recently, uh, recently in the last 10 years, the glymphatic system was discovered. Uh, years ago, Galen or somebody named cells in the brain the glial cells, because glial means glue. They knew they were important, they just didn't know what they did. Well, now we know what they do. Every night, if you get into restorative sleep, there's stuff that's built up in your brain all day. Having a big brain is, is metabolically expensive. We use 25% of our energy in our brain, most of it just keeping us from falling down. So there's a lot of metabolic activity going on in the brain all day. It creates a lot of waste products and they don't need to be staying there. If they, if they stay there, then perhaps things like dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other issues may happen because our brain gets so clogged up it just can't work. So the glymphatic system explains our endogenous protective system. And what it does is, if you look at the printing, it clears beta amyloid protein and other toxic byproducts of brain activity by harnessing those glial cells to use the cerebrospinal fluid that flows throughout the brain and the spinal column uh, as a cleaning agent. It's like a mop, it's like a sponge, it's like a toilet. It's a cleaning crew that comes in at night, and but it only does it during restorative in three sleep. And if the cleaning crew is not in there working, and the cleaning crew is the parasympathetic nervous system. If the parasympathetic nervous system can't get out of the van and come in and clean out the brain because the sympathetic nervous system has got it in a frenzied state all night, then we got a problem. So that's, that's the function of restorative sleep, one of the functions. So let's think, think of this in terms of running a race. That's the Indy 500 racetrack. And for these cars to win, they make left turns and they have to go around 500 times around this track in order to be able to win the race. They can't stop, they can't break down, they certainly can't stop, start running in the opposite direction. That's what it takes to win the race of the Indy 500. And if we think of it in terms of humans running in races, here's a racetrack. Here are a bunch of athletes who probably are all breathing through their noses, especially the ones out in front. In order for them to hit that finish line, they've got to go around that track a number of times as necessary in order to win the race. That's what sleep is. So let's look at the sleep cycle in terms of going around that race track. So there's our start line. Here's where we go to sleep. It's again where we're going to wake up after we go around this track numerous times, hopefully successfully, during the nighttime. So there's N1, the lightest stage of sleep, getting a little bit sleepier. Here's where the really important stuff happens, where we get into N3 sleep, in which our body 
fixes itself and the glymphatic system works. And then REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, where everything is paralyzed in our bodies, where we ha except for our diaphragm, our uh, eyeballs, and our genitalia, oddly, oddly enough. So the N3 and REM sleep are really important. We need to get through them every night if we're gonna wake up with a refreshed body and brain and feel like tackling the next day. And by keeping our autonomic nervous system in balance, instead of having our sympathetic nervous system running rampant 24-7, 365. So there's a shows one night's sleep, and those are the different stepwise running around that track, completing sleep, sleep cycle from the time we go wake up, from the time we were awake till the time we wake up. And what's the big problem that keeps that from happening for everybody we're talking about? Well, in a nutshell, I said eggshell earlier, I meant nutshell, chronic intermittent hypoxia. Not necessarily the absence of breathing, and not necessarily all the time, but from time to time and too frequently, our brains think we're not getting enough oxygen. And so when we're asleep, when that happens, we don't get into N3, don't get into REM sleep. We have what's called N2 inversion. We get kicked back into light sleep. And so we never have any restorative functions. And it's as if that poor runner who has to go around that track eight times a night never makes it around once. He makes it all the way to the first two turns, turns around, runs back to the start line, runs back again. That's what's happening to us during sleep. And dentistry is leading this, this understanding of what's going on. And interestingly, the hardest people we're having uh, any trouble convincing are the orthodontists because once you do something and it's the way you do things and it's profitable and you're efficient at it, uh, if you hear new ideas, which may not be new ideas, but they're new the first time you've heard them, even though they make sense, it may be very difficult to, change, to first start believing uh, new orthodoxies and then be willing to completely change your business model to, and, the, and, and your practice algorithms of how everybody in your practice treats patients every day, that's, those things are hard to change. I mean, I totally understand it. But a tidal wave is coming. It's, and it will probably happen because young dentists and pediatric dentists are going to start doing these things. And eventually it will be taught in orthodontics and dental school, and then it will end up becoming the norm. It may take a while. Even though we're all aware of this, Jules Verne, the great uh, futurist of his time, said even when, when a new idea becomes totally obvious, it may take 10 or 20 years for it to become mainstream. So this wave is coming, and, and the question is, where do you want to be? When it comes crashing down on us and the public is demanding we know this, do we want to get caught, under, caught unawares, or do we, we want to be out front surfing on that wave? And if you're watching these videos, and if this is part of what you're learning, you're already out front on that wave. Now this place actually exists uh, near my hometown. I had to take pictures of it because I couldn't believe I saw it. And at the time we were thinking about current orthodoxies with orthodontists and how hard it was for us to try to talk them into listening to us. And I thought, well, you know, if they really need to dump their own beliefs, this might be a really good school room in which to do it. Now, as I know, that's a little bit obscene, but it really just kind of, uh, it's the glymphatic system of education. And it's not as if we don't have the people in orthodontics to do it because the manpower, the woman power, is already available. If you look at the typical orthodontic office, one or two doctors and all these wonderful auxiliaries who are busy every day doing something, uh, primarily, I guess, doing the orthodontics. But if you have a whole different way of practice, then these wonderful staff personnel could be working with kids, working with parents, working to get the kids to compete with each other, to totally change orthodontics from the current situation where uh, the problem isn't identified until it's too late to treat it, uh, when in fact, 
These children should be seen by age two, treated before age four. This is the big change that's coming and it is coming. And these aren't new, new ideas. 1500 years ago, Buddha himself said, if you want to stay well, just sit up straight, close your mouth, breathe through your nose. That's what uh, McEwen says in his book. That's what all of us tell our patients. It's what our myofunctional therapy patients tell their patients. It's just a simple truth. But there's a lot related to it, and so we have a lot to say about that. I really became aware of this when I, uh, my friend Mark Cruz, who I'd known for a pretty good while, sat down next to me to eat lunch at the International Academy of Nathology and said, hey, uh, I kind of hear you're interested in breathing. And I said, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're uh, treating patients for obstructive sleep apnea with tap appliances. And he said, well, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that. And I, you ought to start out by reading Steve Park's book and, uh, called Sleep Interrupted, and then maybe read a book about epigenetics. So that's what got me started. What's he talking about? And what Mark says is that every inflammatory disease begins with a breathing problem. Well, we're looking at inflammatory disease, and we're, he was the one who really first started connecting with the, dot, the dots between breathing problems and so many disordered uh, medical disorders that uh, apparently are undiagnosed, and if they're treated, only the symptoms are treated. And then Barry Raphael, my other good friend and mentor who started me out on this journey, he said, yeah, every breathing problem begins with a soft tissue problem. So that's why I say it's all about the tongue and the nose. The tongue is 90% uh, of the time the soft tissue we're talking about. Uh, the tongue is the rudder of the brain. The tongue, if it works correctly, facilitates everything we need to do to stay alive. And if it doesn't develop correctly and it doesn't grow the right structures in which to do its job, then havoc ensues. We'll talk about this at great length. Again, it's about the tongue and the nose and the diaphragm, which is the pump for the lymphatic system. Yes, it's about the tongue and the nose, but back to sleep, if you don't want to die in your sleep, change what you do during the daytime. And that's because we're saying that people who can't breathe at night can't breathe during the daytime at all, either. And so let's try to fix all of that. So this finally begins me to the title of this presentation, 2020 Breathing. And I got to take a little break right here again and see what I think I need to talk about next. The title of this uh, presentation, because every presentation should have a title, is 2020 Breathing, because it's 2020. And it is time that we should have 2020 Breathing. I mean, 2020 vision is ideal, right? And let's think about children who go to school. They have their vision tested to see if they're 2020. They have their hearing tested to see if it's, for bad, lack of a better tongue, term 2020. But nobody checks their breathing. Now, interestingly, if the craniofacial respiratory complex structures don't develop in all three dimensions, then the housing for the audio, auditory, and visual systems, the housing for the, for the ear and its canals and its structures, the housing for the orbit, for the eyeballs, they may not grow properly. And so that the tissues that are supposed to enable little kids to be able to see and hear may not work correctly. And this is not a new idea. We see articles from 100 years ago talking about kids who have underdeveloped maxillas and also have hearing and vision problems. So this is the time for 2020 breathing. And it needs to be nasodiaphragmatic. We need to breathe in through our nose using all three thirds of our lungs, not using our intercostal muscles, 
all the way down to the diaphragm, and then all the way back out through our nose with our mouth closed and our tongue sitting up and forward in the roof of our mouth to keep our airway open. That's the goal, 24-7, 365. So let's tell some stories from what we call the walk to wellness. These are stories on that road of ourselves, our friends, our families, and our patients and people we've helped, including me. That's my name. There's my email address. If anybody feels like uh, calling me up to insult me or ask a question, please do so. Uh, this is my passion. This has gone from being a profession to a calling. So thank you for taking the time to listen to my ranting. Part one, my story on the walk to wellness. Okay, there's the road to wellness. Beautiful. We need to get down it as early as we can and to not only walk through it, but run through it. And we need to be doing it without any baggage. And we need to be doing it so we don't become so crippled by our breathing that we have to rely on other physical aids just to keep us going. And yes, it's a long road. This is not McDonald's where you get an instant hamburger. This is Whataburger in Texas where you order your burger and you have to actually wait while they fix it. It's a hell of a lot better and it may drip all over you while you're eating it, but it's a hell of a lot better burger. So it's worth going down the road to get there. And if we have help and we help each other along that road, then we may be able to go first, learn to walk and then to run. And as more and more of us go on this hunt against disease, then more of us can begin to run and help others to run. And if we run in harmony like these wonderful gentlemen, then more can become involved and more can involve involved until it's everybody. That's what we're trying to do. And you're part of it. There are obstructions along the road. This is a great song by Tower of Power. The more you know you know, the more you know you don't know. So you have to humble yourself to be teachable. And once you do, not only are you teachable, but the, but the teachers will appear as I'll show you. Because really, it's what you learn after you think you know it all that really counts. And we're obviously going to be opposed on this. People don't want to hear this. Medicine doesn't want to hear it. Big Pharma sure as hell doesn't want to hear it. I keep joking that if uh, Jeff Rouse does a TED talk, he's going to get caught in a hotel room smoking crack with a hooker, and he's not even going to remember anything about it. I mean, there's going to be violent opposition to what we're doing because it, it affects the, the, uh, the careers and, and finances and stability of many institutions based on symptomatic treatment. But as Schopenhauer said, all truth passes through three stages. First is ridiculed. In other words, you can't tape a mouth. That's ridiculous. Secondly, it's violently opposed. If you do that, those, those people are gonna, are gonna die. If you cut their tongue loose so they can breathe, they're gonna swallow their tongue. Don't do it. Third, it's accepted as being self-evident. And so, yes, indeed, all these things are being done and all of us have patients we can show who are doing better because of it. But we were told not to do it. That's the story of all progress. And the first thing Mark Cruz said the first day in his first course was, don't let your education interfere with what you're going to learn. And he's quoting Einstein, who said, the only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. We have to humble ourselves, open our ears, open our eyes, and open our minds. And boy, is it worth it. Our good friend Roger Pice, who's just as cynical as I am, has come up with some interesting images to illustrate those who uh, are those who violently oppose new thinking. Uh, and he describes conditions that prevent wide acceptance and implementation of our message. And this is a radiograph he came up with of a serious condition. 
Now it appears to be a cranium superimposed over a pelvis, and how could that be? He calls it the craniorectal syndrome, and here's a photograph of that patient. Similar to an ostrich <laughs> with his head in the sand, although this ostrich has his head somewhere else. And you're gonna run into this every day. But don't ridicule them, uh, educate them. Try to get through their fogma. They got where they are because they've learned a lot and their mind may be in a fire because they don't want to hear it. But sooner or later, the public is gonna demand this. And so our job is to educate the public, really. And, you know, it's hard to learn a lot when you're old. I mean, this meat grinder is kind of like my brain was, oh, 15 years ago while I was pretty damn good at fixing teeth but didn't know anything about breathing and thought, maybe I should learn something about that. And then now at this point, what's left of my brain, in order to get one new thought in, I've got to push something else out the other side just to make room in, the, in my semi-hard disk drive. And that's why I think in PowerPoint. If I learn something, I immediately make a PowerPoint slide, save it on my computer, and that way I don't have to remember it until I need to. Then all I have to do is go find it. I feel a little bit like this kid in the far side who says, I need to be excused. <laughs> excused. My brain is full. Uh, that's really how I feel. But it's a good feeling. So the story, 1970, I graduated from Baylor Dental School in Dallas, Texas. This is the, father, the office my father built in 1952. And I went to practice with him in this building at that time. During that time, we've had up to three dentists two hygienists, four assistants, and a lab technician in here at once, which is a little bit crazy. This practice has trained uh, nine dentists, including me. And now today, it's just us. This is our wonderful staff. Uh, boy, I just couldn't do anything without them. They do all my thinking, basically. I just blow whistles, and thank God. I've always really enjoyed the creative part of doing dentistry. Uh, most dentists spend all day taking things apart uh, with a drill. Uh, it's really fun to harness the creative side and put these things back together. You see that picture on that lab there. I had a patient, a you know, lovely young lady who wanted this smile of this princess. I happen to think she's biretronathic and has her own breathing problems, but this is what the patient wanted basically a problem with undersized lateral incisors. And so there's waxing and pressing of ceramics. And I'll probably be in that lab till I die. Uh, it's my really, one of the ways I relax. Dentistry is pretty high pressure. We need time to relax. And I love to relax out on our patio at home, reading books. This picture was made with our wonderful dog who passed away a few weeks ago from a valiant battle with cancer. This picture was made in March, the first day we took off for 90 days for COVID. And if you look in the distance there, you'll see some banana plants that are just starting to grow. Uh, I needed something else to do to keep busy while we were home for 90 days. So I built these boxes and planted some tomatoes. And now here in August, those tomatoes have continued to grow and we're getting a pretty good harvest. And if you look on the banana plants on that patio, they've really grown too. I've still got the same tired old feet. So these are good ways to unwind in the lab, unwind at home. And also I had my first music lesson when I was eight years old and all I ever wanted to do was play music. Ended up playing bands from the time I was 13 years old and ended up going to dental school just to avoid Vietnam. So I've always been playing in a band I uh, love to play the bass, among other, other things. Um, the band I played in for 35 years uh, has tragically ended, uh, related to sleep apnea and depression, which I will show you later. So I now have a nice room at home where we can play a little music and get together with friends and relax by speaking the international language that everyone can understand. A, 
form of art that is so strong that it can pull you in off the street and affect your the way you're thinking, the way you're feeling. Uh, just love music. But let's get back to breathing. My first and greatest teacher was my father, Walter, Walter Thomas Cockwood Jr. You can see there, there's a picture uh, when he was taken into the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. And if you look at the title of his practice, it says endodontics, periodontics, and related restorative dentistry. Because he understood back then that restorative dentistry wasn't possible unless everything else in the patient's mouth was in order. And so he promoted interdisciplinary care way back then. And when he was older, and even when he was older. In 1955, he first wrote out this little hand written lecture that he gave at the Restorative Academy, which was the first time anybody had ever showed a group of dentists how to take an elastic compression of more than one tooth uh, that could be taken into the laboratory so that a, a technician could make indirect restorations without the dentist having to do it. It was a radical concept at the time. Dentists were dripping wax into the mouth and carving inlay patterns directly on the teeth. And he said, now you may have to pay a lab technician a dollar to make this restoration, but I don't think that'll bankrupt you. I'm pretty sure it'll catch on. And boy, did it catch on. It spawned the entire laboratory industry, which is now no longer analog. Uh, it's all done by guesswork and computers. Although I allege still today, we can do better with our hand, eyes, and brain than any computer can. He also was doing endodontics when it was considered a crime. He had to tell patients not to tell anybody he was saving teeth because there was a focus of infection theory then that said if the upper central incisor was infected, you had to take out both incisors on the other side to make sure you got rid of all the infection. And he was pretty convinced you could save teeth with endodontics and did so and wrote about it. And he published in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry trying to convince people that it's okay to do endo, even though it has been a whipping boy of dentistry and medicine. So he was violently opposed and criticized and then completely uh, authenticated when endodontics became a specialty and he was grandfathered in as a diplomat of the Board of Endodontics. He was used to rolling that rock up the hill. And I guess just by watching him, it uh, formed what I was going to end up doing. And he had some great quotes on how to think, and they can all be applied to what we're doing today. And some of them are pretty funny. He says, your intellectual age is inversely proportional to the degree of pain you experience upon hearing a new idea. That's that fogma. He also said the problem, and I have this printed on a piece of paper in my office so that when I can't tell what's wrong with the patient until they're hurting to the point where I can tell or until radiographically we can tell, I just show them what daddy said. The problem will eventually become so obvious that even the dentist will be able to figure out what's wrong. And if we think about this movement towards understanding sleep and breathing, it's the dentist who figured out what's wrong. Isn't that interesting? He also said the best way to know when you're wrong is if everybody agrees with you, which is a great comment, cynical comment on the status quo. And then speaking of himself and pretty much speaking about what I was able to achieve uh, helping myself, most progress is made by those who are too stupid to know what can't possibly work. And interestingly, while I was looking at that, we had some Chinese food and I opened up a fortune cookie yesterday and it said the greatest pleasure in life is in doing what people say you cannot do. I just thought that was a pretty funny coincidence and I found it to be a great pleasure. And his final statement, too many minds are just like concrete. They're all mixed up and permanently set. But if you're watching this video and you're studying these things, 
you're trying to unmix your mind and it is certainly not permanent set, permanently set. So God bless you. Now, maybe there are different ways to open a closed mind. Somebody sent me this picture a long time ago and I thought, well, that's pretty funny. Uh, <clears throat> and then how can I use this slide in this presentation? Are these people telling a story of what's going on today? Uh, I mean, what's going to actually open the closed mind of the people who need to hear it? Public awareness and demand. And what we're trying to do as dentists and our other allied professions here is to ar arise, arouse public awareness until they will demand that doctors and dentists and everybody in healthcare do something about this in a preventive and corrective manner. So who are these people? Well, maybe the, the target there is the current broken medical insurance big pharma system. This is what's ruling the current broken sick care system. These guys. And so public awareness is trying to open the mind of these people, but they're saying, no, no, you can't do that. That's what's going on with these two guys, with these other people are watching. Maybe they're former disciples, maybe they're students, maybe they're the public. What are they saying? Well, he's saying, well, it's about friggin' time somebody did this. This is not new knowledge. We need to grab onto it because it's the future of saving the world. And this guy's saying, well, you mean this is what we all been looking for to save us? Well, yes, it is. And then this guy's saying, well, if that's not what it is anymore, then can I have his Mercedes? Because he's afraid he's going to have to give up his Mercedes if he starts doing the right thing. And really, from the point of view of dentistry, that closed mind we're trying to open our current orthodontic orthodoxies. All right, that's enough symbolism. Um, I enjoy doing that. I hope you found it entertaining. So my father practiced till he was 86 years old. And when he retired, which killed him because he really should have practiced uh, until he died at 91. He said to me, son, I am passing on the torch to you. I had no idea what he meant. I just thought he meant, well, I've showed you how to fix teeth and, and maybe you should keep doing that. And, what torch was he talking about? Well, my whole lifetime, I remember him talking about Weston Price, and he would say the incidence of dental caries in the Inuit population in Alaska is directly proportional to how close they were to the nearest white man's trading post. In other words, these people, these Aboriginal tribes that had the same phenotype with no epigenetic change for thousands of years until they started eating our diet. And that's why we never had white sugar and white bread in our house. I mean, he was really into this and he was into it way beyond what the point where I knew that. And he knew that Weston Price had gone all over the world looking at Aboriginal populations who Likewise, it kept the same inherited phenotypes for generations, 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 till they started doing what we did, which is eating the worst diet on the face of the earth. And with one generation, all these aberrations occurred. And then due to epigenetic tagging of the DNA, these regressive uh, traits were passed on to the next generation. That's the whole subject of genetics and epigenetics, nature versus nurture. So this is what he was talking about. And I didn't realize it until years after his death, I found this article from 1940 that he had written with my pediatrician. And then I knew the torch he was talking about because I was already full speed into the things we were talking about today. I just wish he could have Talk to me about this when he was still alive. We all have regrets. So here's the article. There's Clarence Webb 
raised me, raised my kids, world's greatest pediatrician. He's been dead. I had the honor to have him as my patient and his wife as a patient. And he wasn't just an amateur archaeologist, although this article, which was from the early part of when he first started doing excavations, he discovered this Poverty Point World Heritage Site in Louisiana, which is the largest uh, Native American settlement in the country and is now a world. He was a big deal in archaeology. But he was also thinking anthropologically because he dug up a bunch of skulls from two different groups and he noticed some of them had really nice skulls and some of them had some changes, specifically dental changes. So he brought them to daddy to do the diagnosis of the dental problems and then they came to some pretty interesting conclusions and published this in 1940, five years before I was born. Now I didn't find it till 2015. There were two groups. There was a Gahagan group had these big massive skulls, the kind of which Kevin Boyd is showing us about pre-industrial skulls, how we used to have these massive faces, all 32 teeth, big airways, big cheekbones. And they were hunter gatherers. They had perfect skulls, jaws, and teeth. And then he had also dug up a bunch of skulls from a much later group, the Belcher group, who were right here in our neighborhood, and they were agrarian. They grew beans and corn, which you could tell from the artifacts buried with them. And they had caries, periodontal disease, periapical infections, and missing teeth. And so he brought them to daddy, and they took a look at that, and they came to some inferences. We may infer that the Gahagan group, the one who hadn't deteriorated, depended on hunting and fishing for the preponderance of their food instead of the maize culture of the later Caddo tribes. So that's just pretty interesting because this is early evidence of epigenetic changes brought about by cultural evolution. In this case, dietary changes due to the transition from constantly moving hunter-gatherers to a more civilized, sedentary, agrarian society where we started eating beans and corn, produced more people, sicker people, and started weakening the human race. This is all part of the same Darwinian anthropological history, which leaders like Coraccini, Boyd, Evans, Robley, and others of our friends are studying today to understand what went wrong and how to fix it. So that's the torch my daddy was talking about. I just find this fascinating. So six years into my dental practice, it takes about six years for the average dumb shit dentist to realize he doesn't know anything. And he either he or she either decides that's okay, I'm gonna make a lot of money, or he or she decides I better get to work learning some more to improve my skill sets so I can take the harder right over the easier wrong do better for my patients, feel better about what I'm doing, and maybe still make a good living. So that happened to me in 1976. Baylor just hadn't taught me what we needed to know. What dental school should teach us is that we know just enough to become students. So I was in Chicago and had spent four days at the Restorative Academy and Awkward Academy listening to the world's smartest dentist talk in what seemed like incomprehensible foreign languages because I had no idea what they were talking about due to my ignorance. And it's intimidating and it's easy to say, well, I just don't need to know that. I mean, I walked out on a lecture of Pete Dawson because he said, you have patients in your practice with bite problems every day. And I thought, well, I don't see them, so they don't exist. And all of us have these kind of challenges. But I finally, finally, made a vow in Chicago in 1976, I was gonna start learning more. So the pupil was ready. And when the pupil is ready, the teachers miraculously appeared. It happened for me and it'll happen for you. And sooner or later, you'll be the teacher yourself. I did needed to know something about occlusion. I'd read Pete Dawson's book, which made me realize I really needed to know this. 
So I went to San Antonio to the dental school and took a waxing course from Fred Shaw, who was the head of prosthodontics for the Air Force, had the world's best hands, was one of the first mathologists and really knew how to put all this together in wax so that you could understand the importance of all ridge direction, groove direction, cusp placement, mandibular movement, incision, mastication, all the biomechanics of the stomatonathic system and learn how to recognize it in detail, diagnose it, and execute it. Unfortunately, we weren't thinking about really, once it's chewed the food, how is it swallowed? How is the tongue involved in that? Furthermore, how is the tongue involved with uh, how they were breathing? But it was great to learn these mechanics and we all need to know this. And unless you know them, it's hard to, unless you can understand what normal is, it's hard to recognize abnormal. And these are Fred's big casts that he made twice normal size so we could look at the details of occlusal anatomy and then learn to copy it after learning why. So I took many courses from him and was, he was generous enough to be in a private study club where he taught us basically uh, nathologic dentistry uh, for about three years, which were great things to know, but I still didn't understand. I used to say, Fred, do you charge by the hour or by the year for this stuff? I mean, how are we gonna make a living doing that? I need somebody who will teach me practically how to do it. And Jack Swepston had taught us in dental school. <clears throat> I didn't really understand what he was talking about. But fortunately, he stayed with me after dental school. As I <clears throat> went from learning from Fred Shaw to meeting the wonderful Bill McCarris, who changed my life forever. And those gentlemen really taught me not only about how to use all of this fancy instrumentation, but how to do this stuff on a daily basis. How can we do this on a daily basis so we can really help a lot of people in diagnosing and correcting the problems with the mechanics of their stomatonathic system. We still weren't looking at breathing and chewing and swallowing so much. Mainly uh, bruxism in TMJ problems. My friend Bob uh, Fadal from Waco, Texas, taught me so much about how to manipulate wax and how to make accurate gold castings so that as we learn these things, we could do them in our office every day. And I started all of this with reading Pete Dawson's book, who made me realize how little I knew specifically about the relationship of the muscles, joints, and teeth in the entire system. Uh, and he ended up being a great friend and a great teacher. And so these people had huge influences on my life. And so using that kind of knowledge, uh, here's an example of what we, what we did. Now, this is a, a patient I treated about 20 years ago and I didn't know anything about airway. I just knew he'd worn out his mouth and I knew he was a bruxer. And I knew that nobody had ever really taken a close look at how to fix, how to plan and coordinate treatment. And so we worked as a team. Obviously he's worn out his teeth. Uh, we had uh, crown lengthening, so we had enough tooth structure there on the lower to restore. We had some endo done and we had some implants placed. So we had something on which to base dentistry done with this diagnostic wax up. I was pretty proud of that. Did all my own lab work on it. This is metal ceramic restorations because we uh, didn't have pressable ceramics then. And we restored his mouth, put him in a six tooth night guard, but we weren't looking at breathing. And I should have noticed something. I mean, look how inflamed his gingiva is. And look at his tongue filling up his, his lower arch there. His gingiva is inflamed because he's a mouth breather. And the whole time we were treating him, he said, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. I've always ground my teeth when I was an athlete. He ground his teeth because he was trying to breathe. We totally missed all of that. But we'd all been told that you, if you do this kind of dentistry, you got to the patient's nervous system will make them keep grinding their teeth. We didn't know why. Well, the reason they grind their teeth is they never could breathe. That's why they wore out their teeth. Uh, that's why they're gonna keep on grinding. But we made these night guards. 
And then about two years later, he died from Alzheimer's. And I now know that what we missed the whole time was that he had a lifetime of obstructive sleep apnea that had damn near killed him. And he had destroyed his teeth uh, just to stay alive. And I gave this program at, at the International Academy of Pathology and I was so proud of my, this is before he died. And I was so proud of myself that we knew how to plan and fix this now, but we totally missed the cause. And if we'd known the cause back then, then you can't beat yourself up for what you didn't know. But Charles might be alive today. So unfortunately, we learned from what we got wrong the first time due to our ignorance at the time. We go to war with, with, the, with the weapons we have, but when new weapons come, we need to incorporate them because we may end up fighting a much cleaner war. Learning can really be painful and embarrassing, and we all have failures, but that's what we learn from. I got to present at the Dawson Academy's first two airway symposia in Florida. I got to stay with Pete, uh, in his apartment at the first one. And then again, not too long ago at the third one, I got to stay with him when he was so near the end of his life, he was having trouble breathing and walking. And yet when all the attendees showed up, he it was like he was 30 years younger. And I spent some time showing him the work we were doing. And it was so gratifying for him to originally opposed what we were doing because he thought it was counter to what he was treating to have him accept this and add to his book uh, a phase on airway and then to send me this email uh, probably the greatest honor of my life and he's one of my best friends and teachers and if you as you go through these things you will have these same kind of relationships all right time for another little break here Okay, I'm back from a short nap. Thank you for your indulgence. All right, to recap, we're going painfully slowly through my story of my practice and what happened once I decided, man, I need to know some stuff. And again, that happened about 1975, 76. 75 is when I read Pete's book and realized that's when I had a lot to learn. So after reading his book, I didn't sleep too well. And I began to realize I was doing things at night with, with my jaw and my teeth that I'd never been aware of. And I started looking at my own occlusion. And I realized that my left cuspid, my upper left cuspid was completely worn out. Although when I was chewing, I never went out that far. How the hell did that happen? Must be a parafunctional habit. That's what they called it back then. Somehow I'm getting out there and grinding on that way beyond the envelope of function. What the hell's going on with that? So I related it to my own sleeping position because I realized I was sleeping on my right side with my hand under my face, pressing on my mandible, my head's pushing down, it's moving my mandible over to the left side, and when that happens, my second molars on the right side come into contact in an induced non-working interference, and I've pushed my left condyle out where it's braced. My right condyle can't find a place to go. My teeth are together and the second molar on the right side. And I'm looking for a third, third place to get all those teeth together where it will be what I think is comfortable. A two-legged stool falls down. You gotta have a third leg, the third leg. And it ends up being your cuspid. So I realized I was doing this all night. And then when I would swallow or move around, my jaw would move back and forth in some type of nocturnal bruxism. And I was wearing out my anterior displosion on the left side because of what I was doing at night. And I thought, oh, it's all about sleeping positions. If you did this during the daytime, you would know you were doing that. If you're clenching, you're clenching vertically. You're not way out lateral protrusive like that. Must be a nighttime sleeping problem. So I started writing a little article about it, which I call The Dentist as Sleep Therapist in 1980. Little did I know, 
that I would be a, a dentist who is a sleep therapist many years later. I had no idea. Uh, this just shows maybe some of us just have destinies that are revealed to us a bit at a time. So I wrote this article in the JPD, published in 1985, call it the sleepwear syndrome because I, there's got to be a joke somewhere and we wear our teeth out and I think we do it when we're asleep. And so we used our daughter who was 12 years old to uh, show 12 years old at the time. She's now almost 50 years old teaching Got two, two kids and teaching kids art in school. But back then, she was 12 years old, and here we've had her lie on her left side with her hand under her face, pushing her jaw to the right side and creating the same relationships I was just talking about so we can illustrate it. And so here we see that her left condyle is pushed down and forward, her right condyle is pushed out and braced, her second molars are together on the sleeping side, and now she's together on her cuspids on the other side to st stabilize what is an unstable parafunctional relationship. And then as whatever causes bruxism during the night happens, she moves back and forth, and the first sign we're gonna see is that it wears out her cuspids on that side. And then we'll notice that it goes from the cuspids to the cuspids in the laterals, then all the way to the central incisors, and then maybe eventually all the anterior teeth. And if there are predictable patterns over the years that people will wear if they sleep in those positions. And so that's the article I wrote. What I totally missed was why? Why does the nervous system make us drugs? It's not a parafunctional habit. It's a survival mechanism. It's caused by the sympathetic response to the fact our brain says it's not good enough oxygen. It calls up the fight or flight mechanism and says, do something. And one of the things that's happened is we grind our teeth to try to keep breathing. And it has a function. Jeff Rouse says the body doesn't do any stupid things. This is a very interesting article about how sleep bruxism regulates our autonomic nervous system by triggering the trigeminal cardio, cardiac reflex. And why during sleep? Because what happens is you're releasing all this adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol at night, which is having a very negative effect, including raising the heart rate. And if you have this rhythmic masticatory muscle activity, because of this trigeminal cardiac reflex, it creates bradycardia. It slows down the heart. So it's a compensation that our bodies do to try to get us back into uh, out of sympathetic activity into parasympathetic activity when we're sleeping. So bruxism has a function. But if you remove the cause, then there's no need for that function anymore. Our good friend Roger Price says, we need to look after the patient or attached to the teeth. It isn't just about the teeth. We need to look at their brain, their mind and their body. And the number one job of the brain, the mind and the body is to take the next breath. Nothing else matters. Everything else will suffer so that we can take that next breath. We can go days without water. We can go weeks without food, but how long can we go without breathing? Try it yourself. So the teeth end up being a sacrificial device. This is why the body is willing to give up tooth structure to keep us alive. And my good friend Jim Kessler explained sacrificial devices when he was talking about the evils of putting zirconia uh, in the mouths of people who grind their teeth at night. Why do we want to put in a material that will not wear when the body is insisting that those teeth wear? The sacrificial part is part of a machine or product that is intentionally engineered to fail under mechanical stress, electrical stress, or other ex unexpected and dangerous situations. The sacrificial part is engineered to fail first and protect the other parts of the system. So in other words, if we look at fuses in an electrical system or circuit breakers, they are designed to fail and blow up to keep the house from burning down. 
they have a function. And in Charles's mouth, his body was willing to sacrifice tooth structure to take the next breath. So it would have been nice if we'd recognized that, but we didn't. But let's not make that mistake again. And fortunately, I'm so old, I don't think I'm gonna have to rebuild any more occlusions. So back to the story. Between the 70s and the 90s, what were we doing as we began to learn a little bit more? Well, first we treated bruxism with occlusal equilibration. We believe if you got rid of the skid, bruxism would stop. Well, no, but at least uh, you're clenching with better forces on your jaws and your teeth and your muscles. We restored cuspid disclusion during the daytime so the teeth wouldn't collide and restored it at night in hopes to keep them from doing that bruxism and then covering the whole thing up with the night guard. <clears throat> We kept orthopedic pillows in our closet to give people so if they slept on their side, at least it would take the pressure off their mandible and they couldn't get their hand under their face. And so we realized, we didn't realize that most people who grind their teeth really had to sleep on their side because they had sleep apnea when they were on their back. So we were just trying to figure out ways to help them sleep on their side better, not understanding that it would help with their apnea because we didn't know they had apnea. We were also cautioned to when people had acute temporomandibular joint pain to drug them up with, with halcyon and get them to sleep on their back. And sure enough, they couldn't brux at night because they weren't pushing on their jaws. And so their joint pain would get better. But let's think about this. If they were back sleep, they were avoiding sleeping on their back because they had sleep apnea. And when they get into REM sleep, they uh, the, not only does gravity take their jaw back, taking the tongue uh, with it to close the airway, uh, when they get into atonia of, of REM sleep, everything collapses. And so we might, might kill them with sleep apnea trying to get their jaw pain to go away. But we did this for a while. I think it was kind of a bad idea. But we keep learning from what we got wrong. We did an awful lot of complete reconstructions, my, mainly in gold. Uh, which is still the world's finest restorative material, but we have done some of it in ceramics. And so I tend to use Emacs because it's closer to enamel. But while we were rebuilding all these mouths, we were totally unaware that breathing problems were the reason they need their mouths rebuilt. We knew bruxing was part of it. We tried to control that, but we didn't realize it was because they couldn't breathe. And we did not realize that after we had rebuilt their mouths, if we put a, any type of night guard in the way of this, there are studies that show that that will inhibit their protective response. They can't get their jaw forward the way they used to. It may raise their apnea hypopnea index and make their sleep apnea worse. So these are all things we did really thinking we were enlightened and helping a lot of people for about 20 years. And I think a lot of that was wrong too. So what happened in the 1990s? Well, I'd known Keith Thornton since we were at Baylor together and uh, I heard him give a talk about treating obstructive sleep apnea with these tap appliances that he had invented. And he and I had been talking about what people did at night for a long time. So I, I thought, Let, let's go take this course. So I took his course, which began a lifelong friendship and collaborative relationship. And we got back and bought a pulse oximeter and got an RN sheet with inventory of symptoms on it. And if we saw a patient we thought had trouble breathing, we would screen them with pulse oximetry and see if they had sleep apnea. All we were looking for was sleep apnea because that's all we'd heard about. That's all doctors were treating. Why should we be worried about anything else? But I immediately began to notice that a lot of these people who had a lot of symptoms didn't have an apnea hypopnea index of five. They didn't have sleep apnea. They had upper airway resistance syndrome. And some of them had been so aware of their problems, they had had sleep studies. And because their AHI was so low, the sleep physician and their physician said, oh, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You just need some sleep hygiene. Well, they're not fine. 
they're sick. They're going to, yeah, sooner or later, they're going to have apnea because right now they've got pre apnea and they need our help. They've got more symptoms than the other people. And even when patients start getting referred to you for breathing problems, for every patient you can identify with diagnosable obstructive sleep apnea with an apnea hypnea, apnea hypnea index of greater than five, you're going to see five or six other patients who have upper airway resistance, wouldn't fail a sleep test, and would be told by their doctors that they're okay when they're not okay. So who's going to treat them? It's us. So that's John Howe, great sax player, good friend, wonderful singer. I saw him one morning early eating breakfast and eat out of sleep study. And they said, you've got obstructive sleep apnea and the only way to treat it is to go in with a knife and cut out the whole back of your throat, the UPP procedure. And I said, I had a patient who had had that and they sounded like they were talking out of the bottom of a 50 gallon drum and coffee came out their nose when they tried to talk and green peas came out their nose. And I thought, that's probably not a good idea, John. I know a guy in Dallas who makes devices. Let's make you a tap appliance. And so we made our very first tap one appliance for John in 1999. This is when we tipped our toe like Eddie Murphy for playing James Brown into the hot tub of dental sleep mess. So there's Keith Thornton in his office. And if you look at this sweet lady, she was a polio patient when she was a kid, spent most of her life in an iron lung. But now she runs a very successful business from that wheelchair. And what you can't see behind that wheelchair is a ventilator that blows air at four times the speed of a CPAP machine. And it's he's taken an impression now for a custom tap mask that fits on that so that she can lead a successful business during the daytime wearing this interface that Keith made her. And Keith always says, well, I just treat the roadkill in sleep medicine, and that's as close to roadkill as you can get. But he has saved this woman's quality of life, and he's given her the ability to get out, get out of her wheelchair, get out of her, get out of her iron lung, get out of her house, and have social contact and run a business. Keith is indeed the father of dental sleep medicine. The work he has done has enabled everything that we're doing here today. This is an article that Ron Prynne and I wrote uh, a few years ago in the JPD showing the technique for how to make one of these masks. Here, it's showing him taking the impression. So if anybody's interested in that, that can be found in the JPD. This is the one of the most current iterations of the TAP appliance, the TAP Dream. Keith is willing to bear the expense of going through the FDA to constantly change the design of these appliances as his thinking has moved away from, let's just drag the jaw forward to let's create enough room for the tongue and try to get people to breathe through their nose. This MyTAP trial appliance uh, is a great service. Uh, theoretically, it's to help somebody immediately who needs help. Uh, and if it works, then maybe they need a better appliance. Although I've had a patient, we did the, uh, we tested 50 patients with prototypes of these to see if they'd work. And I've got a patient who's been wearing one of these prototypes for six years. So it can actually, if we're just looking for managing people at night, it can be a great way to do it. This is probably his best invention. It's a CPAP mask that attaches to the upper teeth so there are no straps. It doesn't move and it insists on nasal breathing. And we've had numerous patients referred to us for oral appliances who had CPAPs be able to go back and use their CPAPs by using this mask. So Keith has done a hell of a lot for me. He's done a hell of a lot for helping people. And although I firmly believe that we need to move beyond just management, let's say, for example, that my tap can be bought in a bag at a CVS pharmacy. And Joe Sixpack, after his wife has been nagging him and making him sleep on the couch, can go in and buy a my tap, fit himself, and stop snoring at night. 
this can help millions of people, which is a lot better than no help at all. So today, what about oral appliances? They are an, um, an improved medical first line of defense to manage obstructive sleep apnea, but they aid breathing only at night. This is a, uh, uh, a, little, a little device made out of silicone. It's a mouse shield that fits over the mat tap to allow minimal protrusion more vertical dimension if you if you prop them open, and then uh, this this obturator keeps their mouth closed at night, so it encourages nasal breathing. So these are approved devices. If you fail the sleep test and you say you are an oral appliance or you fail CPAP and you have a letter from your doctor, uh, then you can go see a dentist with a prescription and. Patients' health insurance should pay for them to make a laboratory custom appliance. So that's an approved medical first line of defense delivered by a dentist that is state of the art today. But ignores the fact that disordered breathing is a 24 7, 365 problem. And as helpful as these protocols may be, there are only management strategies. The airways in these patients continue to collapse over time, and all mechanical treatment protocols produce bad oral dental side effects over time. The patients may continue to breathe dysfunctionally the other 16 hours of the day, and CPAP patients who are fat can't lose weight because dysautonomia during the daytime. So that's when we began thinking, okay, we can manage it. What if we can cure people? Because this is not what we want to see when we show up at the office Monday, David has been wearing a tap appliance successfully without a, a liner for five years, but he broke his a liner and this is what his bite looks like when he shows up on Monday morning. This is what it started out with. This is what we got now. He's had changes in his arch form and in the bony structures of his CRFC. He is now an orthomathic patient. Here's Linda, we rebuilt her mouth because it needed it years ago. And then we noticed she couldn't breathe. And so we did oximetry, saw that she had an AHI of 45, put her on the very first my tap, got her down to a five, made her a laboratory tap. She wore it for five years, we're using an AM liner and did great. And her sweet husband came up to me in the parking lot, gave me a hug and said, thank you for giving me back my wife. Well, then her husband got Parkinson's disease and she quit taking care of herself to take care of him, quit wearing her liner for five months, and this is what she showed up with. Now, it, what if we could have treated her nighttime breathing some other way without creating this kind of problem? Including the problem we created in my own wife who wore a tap for five years before an AM liner was available. And now she's got this edge-to-edge -edge occlusion and posterior bilateral open bite. So our good friend, orthodontic friend, Sanders Graff spent three years with Invisalign to get her front teeth back together, but she's still got a posterior deficiency and now needs a reconstruction. And I'm getting too old and tired to do this stuff. So how about a cure? Now we've had a lot of people do just great with taps over the years and they keep making them new ones. But if we're starting out with a new patient now, if I can avoid this, that's what I want to do. And if we have to use it, I want to get them off of it as quickly as I can. Again, unfortunately, we learn from what we got wrong the first time. Learning can be painful and embarrassing. All right, this shows uh, an early ad that Keith had for the tap appliance that shows if you put a tap in the mouth and drag the jaw forward enough, you can see the pharyngeal airway gets wider. Time to take another break. Got to take a breath. Got to figure out what we're going to say next about this. I'm sorry this is so slow, but I've been asked to tell this story. 
Okay, you wonderful people out there need to be thankful that I pause uh, from time to time because you really don't want to watch me adjusting my underwear, spraying my nose with saline spray and gargling with, list, gar and gargling with Listerine so I can keep on ranting. So you've been spared that. All right, early on, <clears throat> I was on the sleep. Uh, I was on the sleep medicine faculty at LSU Dental Medical School here in Shreveport for about 10 years. And I went to Grand Round Lectures every Wednesday morning for about 10 years. And at least once a year, I would lecture to the sleep residents. Actually, this, this entire story began when I was asked to give a lecture about eight years ago to, uh, to the sleep residents, the neurology residents, and the pediatric residents at LSU to try to show them from a dental perspective how all of this tied together. And so in trying to explain to these physicians, uh, and at the time, the only tool I had was the TAP appliance, and I thought it was a great success, and it is a great success within its limitations. I wanted to put it in language that anybody could understand. So we took a balloon, took a picture of it, and that's the tongue. Then we took one of these diagnostic cast boxes and said, okay, that's the oral cavity. And why do people have trouble breathing? What's their tongue got to do with it? Well, they've got a structure and function mismatch. That tongue is too big for the mouth. And we see all these diagnoses of ankle of, of, of macroglossia, huge tongue. And yeah, it exists. But in 99% of these patients, you'll see the tongue's the right size. It just never grew a structure around it big enough for it to work with it. And I call that structure the linguatorium because the tongue conducts the business of life and it needs the right room in which to do it. That's the linguatorium. And oddly enough, the tongue grows that space. And though we didn't know that, we didn't thinking about it back then, so we won't talk about it yet. So here's how the tap appliance works for all mandibular advancement appliances. We take that same tongue and we crank the mandible forward. We weren't thinking so much about vertically and we created a bigger box. And once we've got that bigger box, then we've got success because that tongue now has room. Doesn't it? Is that enough? No, it's not enough. Room for the tongue alone is not enough. So if we make another box and put another tongue in it and then put in the nasal airway, we can see what the problem is. Something's blocking something. So let's revisit that bigger box concept. We look at this picture and the tongue now appears to have an adequate linguatorium into which conduct functional nasal diaphragmatic breathing. I wasn't thinking about chewing or swallowing then either. But people who can't breathe can't chew right. People who breathe breathing can't chew right, can't swallow right either. It all needs to be identified and fixed if we're gonna walk that patient to wellness. So what's the problem? What's going on right here? Well, the base of the tongue is still shutting off the nasal airway. <clears throat> Compromised airflow, compromised by this, enough to sustain SpO2 at the expense of the autonomic nervous system without arousals may be possible. In other words, even with this partial obstruction, it's better. And the patient may sleep better at night without waking up, but it may not fix the problem because something is still in the way because the nasal oropharyngeal airway is still compromised. The tongue has got to be up and forward like this out of the oral pharynx to provide a patent nasal airway. As we see in this patient, there's a long soft palate, an underdeveloped maxilla, very short, but the tongue is up and forward so far that there's still a patient, a patient I'm going to try that in English, a patent nasal airway. So there's an inherent conceptual fallacy in all MAD appliances. And that is 
It's not the mandible that needs repositioning and retraining. It's the tongue. So now we've been moving along. It's We've gone through the 70s, 80s, 90s. Now we're in the 2000s. We're getting there. I told you I'd tell this story, but it's a slow story. It took me 20 years. It may take a couple of hours to do it. So we began looking beyond airway management strategies to look for a cure for disordered breathing and the comorbidities. This required learning much, much more about the anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, structure, function, and behavior. That's the big three, structure, function, and behavior. Uh, Barry will tell you that, Mark will tell you that. Those are the three things we have to address. <clears throat> and the interrelationships of all these systems in order that we could be able to tell what's wrong with people and then promote functional breathing. And this still remains a work in progress today. We're still trying to figure this out, but I'll show you what we, have, what we think we've learned uh, how I treated myself, and then how we were trying to apply this to other people. Again, it's all about the craniofacial respiratory complex and how it all develops. 2010 was a big turning point in our philosophy and pra practice based on so many things we were ignorant of. We began to learn from an entirely group, new group of teachers who were connecting the dots. That's Mark Cruz's term between disordered breathing and a chronic inflammatory disease. And you'll have to forgive me if somebody just rang my doorbell on my day off. Well, that time it was UPS. I hope you all are enjoying this adventure as much as I have. I unplugged the phone and locked the door, but I still can't quite get alone. So we started to learn from all these, all these new people. They were connecting the dots. Mark Cruz was the first one to look at all these inflammatory disease processes, growth development issues and make them all connected. And that was the name of the first course I took. And that's when I realized this is what I had to be doing with my future. That's when, when this, my profession went from a profession to a calling. They understood that the source of disordered breathing was due to impaired growth and development of the CRFC. It's that simple, although it's not simple. But if we, if we don't grow right, we're not going to be right. We're not going to breathe right. We're going to be sick. We're going to die early. And the tongue is what causes it all. And they had some very good ideas about how to actually cure these problems instead of just managing them. Other than teaching people how to brush and floss, we really had never adopted any, any true preventive measures into helping people be healthy. And here was an opportunity to instill preventive help to take very sick people and help them get well. If once you start doing this, your life will never be the same. You will never go back. Even if you don't make any money doing it, you won't care. So Mark Cruz, first grade teacher, Barry Rayfield, his brother by another mother. These two guys put on innumerable numbers of of spree casts and zoom casts, bringing in specialists from all over the world uh, at no cost to just try to educate those of us to raise our aware awareness so we can help people and raise public awareness. Mark and Barry together put together the uh, Airway Mini Residency, which I took and which so many other people have learned from. And their goal really was to teach the teachers and I certainly wouldn't be here today doing this if it weren't for them and for my good friend Kevin Boyd from Chicago. Uh, interestingly, the very first of those spree casts, which was pretty funny, uh, that was the four of us talking to each other and trying to see if we could talk to each other and show slides and somehow do it by video years ago. These are some of my closest friends and mentors. 
And on one of the first precasts, we had the wonderful Kathy Winslow, who talked to us from, from the lounge in an airport while she was on a trip. She gave us our very first exposure to, she was at the, uh, before the, this precast I'm talking about, we met her at Mark's first course, and she showed a bunch of us the basis of uh, buteco breathing. Got us interested in how important it was to change people's behavior through myofunctional therapy. Got on Skype with Paula and me, Paula, my hygienist, who wanted to be a myofunctional therapist, and gave us an introduction to get us started years ago into what we now do every day in our practice. And on that spree cast, she said, you know, you need to ask every airway patient if they were breastfed. She said, that may sound like an uh, inappropriate thing to ask for a patient, but you need to know this because it'll help you understand the origin of their problem. I have asked every airway patient since then that question, and I have yet to see a patient with obstructive sleep apnea who was breastfed. That's how big a deal it is. That's part of the, of the cultural de-evolution that's going on where we are breeding ourselves to extinction because we have abandoned mother nature's prescription for growth and development in early nursing and then immediately what kind of foods the kids eat after they're not nursing anymore. Huge factor, incredibly uh, important today because too many of the wrong choices are being made. There's so many places where the kids are running the show and choose what they're doing or the mother doesn't want to have to be encumbered by doing this. And yeah, it's probably hard to commit to doing breastfeeding. And I had a, uh, Kevin's my functional therapist said, I shouldn't even be talking about breastfeeding because I'm just a man, but it's a big deal. This is Paula Watkins, who has been my hygienist for 46 years, who had her own breathing issues and became the first OMT and Buteco therapist in Louisiana after studying with Joy Moeller, Patrick McEwen, and Sandra Colson. She and uh, Andrew Banker, the surgeon who we had to talk into doing a tongue release, uh, and the second patient who he treated was his father, after which he got Paula to teach him how to breathe. Paula and Andrew have probably done more to have positive impacts by changing structure, function, and behavior and making people well than anything I've ever done, just as the diagnostician uh, quarterback with a whistle and provider of acrylic pieces and tape. So during that period, uh, you know, Mark said, read Sleep Interrupted. That's what first made me understand what, uh, what UARS was all about, how important it was. <clears throat> and we've given innumerable copies of this book to uh, other physicians, other dentists, and patients before we treat them so that they can understand their own story and become participants in their treatment. Because if the patients don't do their part, there's no point even trying to help them beyond putting them in some type of my time appliance. Uh, Daniel Lieberman's story of the human body gives us a good idea of uh, evolution and what's happened and the shape we're in today and how that happened, what those influences were. Patrick McEwen can tell us an awful lot about what happens when you don't breathe through your nose and what happens when you do and why that's important. These are all for good for educating us and educating our patients. Uh, this is Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who is a brilliant neurologist, anthropologist, who spent years with the Messiah Warriors in Africa, and they breastfeed until age five, and their diet consists primarily of the blood and meat of cattle they grow, very limited diet, yet they're all about eight feet tall and incredibly healthy and their phenotype hadn't changed for thousands of years because they are still sticking with what for them was mother nature's prescription for growth and development. Uh, Sapolsky probably knows more about stress than anybody in the United States. He has some great videos from Stanford where he, where he works on what stress is, what it does to our body. And he's written several editions of this wonderful book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcer. 
if you want to understand what stress does, read this book. It's a great explanation of the biomechanics and physiology and biochemistry of stress so that even I could understand it. How the HPA axis works and the damage it does when it shouldn't be working and how our bodies can't differentiate between different types of stresses. Zebras don't get ulcers because the only stresses they realize are real ones. Humans make up our own stresses and one of the biggest stresses we have we don't exactly make up is we can't breathe when we're sleeping. This edition has a little chapter on sleep and how he has insomnia, but he doesn't really talk about it because at this point he had really missed the fact that big bad breathing is the number one endogenous stressor. This is what five or six years ago. So I wrote him a letter and suggested, hey, when you're at Stanford, Dr. Christian Gimeno, who discovered OSA, who discovered UARS, who understands it's all about growth and development of children, understands that breathing is the cause of all this stress, you should go talk to him because you can learn a hell of a lot from each other and it'll help you teach. Well, I never heard anything from him, probably never even opened a letter. But now, this book that I already showed you by Sandra Kahn and Paul Ehrlich, talking about all these things, look who wrote the foreword, Robert Sapolsky. And then Kahn and Ehrlich and some other people have just published this wonderful 28 page article about all the things we're talking about here. And if you look, you'll see Robert Sapolsky is now an author. So I think in the last five or six years, we now know that he's on board. And now that he's on board, the key to this movement is gonna be public awareness through information going viral on social media. And I think he may be one of the ones along with James Nestor who can make that happen. It's very exciting for me to see this happen. And so then, after I've been doing all this reading and studied with Mark and Barry and Kevin on some basics, then I met some more great teachers. Actually, I met Ted Belford, Mark's first course, when he was talking about homeoblocks. And shortly thereafter, in one of, uh, one of Barry's courses in the AMR in his office, I met Scott Simonetti, Ted's partner, and I'd been talking to him a lot already, and he ended up developing this preventive oral appliance, which we now use every day, and we'll talk about at great length. And uh, Scott is probably the smartest guy I know in terms of understanding on the microcellular level, the physiology, biochemistry of, of chronic sensitization syndromes, inflammatory disease and how it's all related to the way we breathe. Also, uh, through these courses, got to meet Roger Price, who's become a great friend. He really got me thinking about carbon dioxide. <clears throat> the 10 years I was on the faculty of the medical school in the sleep department, everybody just talked about oxygen. Nobody ever talked about carbon dioxide, but it is really important. Uh, for a while, I thought I understood it, but after talking to Scott Simonetti, I'm not sure. But it's still really important. One of the things we all need to really get our minds around because it's critical. So for years, there's Bob Cronin, one of my great friends, great restorative dentist, ran the Air Force prosthodontic training program at Lack Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, after which he ran the graduate prosthodontic program at the dental school in San Antonio. And he used to have me come down and teach how to make gold castings, how to trim dyes, how to wax, cast, invest, cast and finish gold castings, and later Emax castings, because they had to do all their own lab work in graduate school, and somehow they were graduate or undergraduate education failed them to teach, failed to teach them how to do this. So this was the first course I taught. And if you look in the front there, you'll see somebody, the young Jeff Rouse. Jeff Rouse was one of the residents and he had given up a lucrative practice 
to get his credentials in uh, prosthodontics so that he could uh, so that he could be a teacher and be qualified to do that. He made a huge sacrifice to do that. And Jeff is a big deal now in airway dentistry. And I was talking to him in 2014, and he said, "This is when we were first starting to connect the dots." And said, "God, look at this! Is that breathing?" And he said, I'm driving my office staff crazy by seeing a problem, asking, could Airway explain this? And I was going through the same thing. And the more you look at this, the more you'll go through the same thing. Because it's, as our president would say, huge. It's huge. It, it affects, it's responsible for the sickness in half the patients who walk into your office every day. It's responsible for the sickness in half the people in your family who are sick and half your friends who are sick. It's all about breathing. Of course, Jeff now teaches at the Spear Institute and lectures all the time and has created the core blog uh, that we've been on for about 10 years where I rant from time to time. Uh, it's the core dentistry blog, and it's a very powerful forum by those of us who are trying to listen and learn and learn from each other to, for the greater good. Jeff has just been a good friend, and he's been very powerful. And he said, first I would ask you now, Jeff's a great thought leader. Those of you who are taking this, this international virtual symposium, you're gonna be the next thought leaders. We're a bunch of well, worn out old farts. You're the ones who are gonna go forward with this. Because today there really aren't any experts. I'm sure as hell not an expert. I've just showed you more failures than successes. There are no experts at this time, only good people trying to improve the lives of people that they care about. So these are exciting times. Patient story number one. Now you think I'm gonna finally show you how I treat myself and my own lifetime struggle to breathe. But let's take a look at my face. Well, what we haven't talked about, we've talked about improper growth of the CRFC, but we haven't really looked at it. And how does it affect our faces? And so how does it affect our faces and how does it affect our airway and is it possible to take a sick airway and make it into a better airway? And sure enough, if you look at my face before treatment, my left side was really underdeveloped. So let's talk about faces. That's my face. You can see some problems with it. We'll go into it later. And you can, that, that is the URL for this camera if you want to import pictures and do this study of facial symmetry. I got to talk about some other people's faces first because it's important that we all be able, by the time we look, we should be in public and sitting in an airport and look at the guy or woman across from us and be able to tell if they got these problems. When a new patient comes into our office, by the time we watch them walk down the hall, we come around get them seated in the chair and look at them in the face. Just by what we've seen already, we should know what questions to ask because it's, that's so, it's as obvious as the nose on your face because it is the nose on your face. So before we talk about my face and how we regrew it, hopefully for the better, we gotta talk some more about faces. I was asked to tell this story and so here it is. We must learn how to look at our patients' faces and postures. Now, I didn't know this person. He was our district attorney. He died in his sleep at age 67 of undiagnosed heart disease in a motel on a, on a legal trip. These three pictures were in the paper. And I spent a lot of time thinking about these three, three pictures, and I had to like lecture to a bunch of physicians about the CRFC. And so I showed this because I didn't know if any of those physicians had been his physicians. But this was to suggest that had they not spotted these things in him, maybe they should take a look at them in the future. <clears throat> and this comes from a 
poster I gave at the Restorative Academy years ago of three famous people, Tim Russer, James Gandolfini, and Robin Williams. Look at their faces. They all have things in common. All three of them died prematurely. All three show cranial facial dysplasia, which we will talk about, from lack of proper growth and development. And I'm guessing all four of them had bicuspid extraction, retraction orthodontics. Let's look at our former vice president. Look at his profile, like Punch and Judy. This is what Mike Mew calls craniofacial dysplasia. It's bimaxillary retrusion. It's class four occlusion. Upper and lower jaw are underdeveloped and they're all too far back in his head. And I think he also probably had teeth out and had orthodontics. And he's a big proponent of doing exercise every day. Well, why? Because I think he's got sleep apnea. And I think this is what his oximetry would look like. And he's part of a subset of gym rats. I've seen patients like this. They're skinny, healthy looking men with really bad sleep apnea who don't have control of the apnea and they overcome it all day by doing excessive amounts of running and cardiovascular exercise to compensate for it. And if you look at other clues on Paul Ryan, you can see how tired his eyes look. And you shouldn't be able to see the whites of his eyes below his pupils. That's called scleral shine, which shows that the CRFC is not developed. He doesn't have uh, the structures of his maxilla and the base of his orbit. So his eyelids are, are, are drooping and there's uh, venous pooling underneath there, which is a sign of his chronic inflammatory disease. And here's another athlete who obviously has the same problems, who has overcome some of them by becoming really good at exercise. And he also freely admits that he's had a lifetime struggle with ADHD, which we are pretty damn sure is not a psychological problem, it's a breathing problem. And once again, if you look back at Paul Ryan's face, that's what he needed. That's how he developed. And he might have developed like this if they hadn't taken out teeth. And it's possible to develop this today. And that's what we'll talk about. Looking at faces to see the problems. So let's go back and look at the faces of other people. Now, you can hit your pause button here. I don't plan to go through all of this, but I said you're going to see this everywhere. I was watching the evening news with Lester Holt. These are all the things I can see just from watching him. Is the phonetic problems he's got, jaw issues he's got, problems with his lower tongue, compensations he's making with his face, and sure enough, he's got an asymmetric face. So it's everywhere. And to a large degree, we compensate. But if we don't compensate and we're sick, then maybe we should address these deficiencies. So let's finally get back. Well, eventually we're gonna get back to me, but let's talk about our DA first. The patient's face and head posture will tell us which questions to ask. His face and posture suggest a lifetime of dysfunctional breathing. If you were to look at oximetry on him, the night before he died peacefully in his sleep, and people don't die peacefully in their sleep, they choke to death in their sleep during their last REM cycle at five in the morning. It'd probably look like this. He probably had severe sleep apnea at recurring intervals all night. How can I make these inferences just by looking at these pictures? Well, because a large degree, it's my medical history. I can see the problems in my face when I'm less than a year old. I can see the problems in my face when I'm 68 years old. I had no idea how to look at it then. I just thought, well, it's just a sick and tired old face. Wasn't able to identify what was going on. As a young man, he clearly shows cranial facial dystrophy and signs of obstructive sleep apnea. Look how high his forehead is. That's because his tongue never developed his maxilla or his vasocranium laterally. That made his forehead grow vertically. <clears throat> he has excessive vertical growth of his maxilla. Look how long his upper lip is. 
Look at his lack of lower facial development. No muscle tone, his mouth's hanging open. He's got a thin supported upper, unsupported upper lip. It's not really a thin upper lip. There's just no max, maxilla and maxillary teeth behind it to turn the lip outside in the way it should be. He's got the classic profile of a mouth breather. He's got his head forward and down, especially in the other pictures, with his shoulders stooped forward, his mouth's open. Doesn't have any muscle tone from the eyes down, beginning with his orbital muscles where he's got all this that's slack tissue and, and venous pooling. He's got a high BMI, he's got a big neck size, he's got that venous pooling under his eyes. His craniofacial uh, CRFC is just not developed. Look how narrow his nose is. It's a big nose, but it's not developed laterally because he didn't develop this maxilla. That part of his nose next to his glasses is his maxilla, it's not his nasal bone. He's got this narrow bridge of his nose, and the tip of his nose is pointed down because it's been dragged down by his, his long upper lip. It's not where it should be, and he's got very narrow nostrils because his nasal passage hasn't developed either forward or laterally. He's got underdeveloped orbits and cheekbones. He's got deep nasolabial folds. That's the key that you see in all these people. You know, those three people. Gandolfini and, and Robin Williams and Tim Russer, deep nasolabial folds because everything's shoved back into their face, trapping their tongue against their, you know, the back wall of their airway. He's got asymmetric facial development. His ears are at different heights. His whole CRFC, as I just said, is retruded and his tongue is trapped. So he can only breathe through his mouth and probably not too well that way. And his lower teeth are crowded because his maxilla never developed enough. <clears throat> Bill Hang says, you look at these pictures of these people and you can guess their medical history. And I'm thinking this is probably a lot of what happened to him when he was growing up. Just from looking at the pictures of a man I don't know. This is the lifetime continuum of disordered breathing beginning in his childhood. He had a laryngopharyngeal reflux where he was breathing up a mist of stomach acid and bacteria when he was a kid, leading to asthma, chronic sinus infections, coughing, chronic otitis media with tubes in his ears, allergies, and perhaps uh, tonsillitis. I just said asthma twice, I'm sorry. Tonsillitis and adenoid infections. He probably ate very loudly ate too fast because he couldn't eat and breathe and swallow and make it all work at the same time. And he didn't know how to chew and he didn't know how to swallow. He couldn't coordinate any of those activities. At night, he probably had insomnia or night terrors or bedwetting or snoring or ground his teeth at night. In the morning, his bed was all messed up because he kept moving around all night because he couldn't get a consolidated sleep. And he may have ended up in his parents' bed in the night because he was just couldn't sleep because he couldn't breathe. Just because he was releasing adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol, and everything else was out of balance. Might have had difficulty in school, maybe behavioral problems, maybe ADHD. Probably ate too much because he, his leptin and ghrelin imbalance were off. As an adult, he probably had to take a lot of caffeine in the morning to get up and, and get going because he was so fatigued and so anxious. And he was well known to enjoy a drink at night. I think a part of that was he was so wired from being tired during the daytime, he had to medicate with alcohol just to try to get to sleep so that he could spend all night not breathing. Probably had GERD as an adult or some type of digestive problems. Uh, with his weight and his head posture, I would guess he had back pain and neck pain, may have had morning headaches. May have been walking around with brain fog, not too good for a DA. Probably had a lot of recurring chronic illnesses, uh, central uh, sensitization syndromes. So that's what I'm guessing. Never met him, never saw him. That's just what those pictures tell me might have happened. That's why we need to look at faces. And that's how we end up dying young from the comorbidities of obstructive sleep apnea. But I digress. And I'm finally through digressing. And we're finally going to show. What happened to me? My own story. 
but I'm going to have to take one more little break first. Okay, I can't believe this is still just part one of a three part video. And I said we were going to tell in part one my story. And that was the story. But not the story of my illness and the story of genetics and epigenetics and what happened to me, how it damn near killed me. Uh, and what we did based on what these wonderful teachers taught me to try to treat myself and what the results were. So it's all about nature and, and nurture, genetics and epigenetics. In this first picture, there I am in my mother's lap. And my sister Sarah on the left was nine years old when I was born. My sister Kit was 10 on the right. And if you look at my mother with her long upper lip and recessive lower jaw, you can see both of my sisters have the same thing as I came into this world with it. As you'll see, my father had the same thing. So yeah, this is genetic. We pass it on. If you look at my sister Kit on the upper right there, look at her eyes. Look at her upper front teeth. They're retroclined. She's got a thin upper lip. Her eyes are asymmetrical and she's got bags under her eyes. So we were genetically engineered to have this problem. And perhaps if I'd been breastfed, I would have done better. But after having these two older kids, my mother wasn't about to fool with breastfeeding. And so there I am. I don't have circles under my eyes yet, but I look tired and fatigued. And you can see there's stuff running out of my nose. There's stuff running out of my mouth. My ears are already asymmetrical, and I just don't really look like a healthy, alert child right there. So I was mouth breathing and I was already allergic to a lot of things, including the formula they tried to put me on. I was allergic to wheat. I was allergic to soy right out of the box. If you look at this picture, this is a baby with obstructive sleep apnea trying to breathe. And that child died from sudden infant death syndrome. Doesn't take a lot to make the connection between poor breathing and sudden infant death syndrome, just part of connecting the dots. And there's a picture of me in the same position. I got my head way up and back, just trying to get my airway open. And I'm breathing through my mouth, and I'm breathing through my mouth, and I'm breathing through my mouth. I can't find a picture of me as a child where I had my mouth closed. So their genetic and epigenetic factors that prevented my oral facial development. There I am with my mother. There I am with my father. You'll notice a similar profile in all of us. Look at my recessive lower jaw. I already got my head and shoulders coming forward here. I got that concave face. And if you have that concave face at age three, you're gonna have it at age seven. The time to fix it is between age three and age seven. If you don't fix it at age 50, you got the same thing and all the baggage that goes along with it, and you end up looking like Whistler's mother or like Adolf Hitler. And it could be that developing like that might somehow affect your personality and your thinking. So at this point, I've already got sore throat and I took my tonsils and adenoids out. Here you can see the posture, you can see the retroclination of my anterior teeth, you can see the deep nasal labial folds, you can see the big circles under my eyes. During that time I had eczema, chronic sinus infections. I had to get my sinuses pumped out every week. I had to take PBZ, oral antihistamines, every day. My head and shoulders were coming forward to compensate. I was, a, I was still skinny, I hadn't got fat yet, but I was not thriving. In 1956 is when I started gaining weight, and at age 18, topped out at almost 300 pounds. 1958, I went off to a prep school in Massachusetts, and here you can see the chubby schoolboy, until a doctor wrote me a prescription. They were concerned about my weight, so they put me on diet pills for weight loss. 
and just kept me on for years. Dexedrine. Boy, the last thing I needed were a bunch of stimulants when I was already in dysautonomia and a shit storm of sympathetic activity uh, from all the problems I had because I already was a mouth breather and couldn't breathe at night. And couldn't chew and couldn't swallow. But who, let's just give him something to make him lose weight. Let's don't address the cause. So I lost some weight and started gaining it again because nothing happened to change the problem. And during those four years of high school, I had trouble with weight just despite the medication. I was anxious, I was depressed. I had a bad strep throat that, that uh, gave me bed sores. I ended up having to take penicillin for three months after that for acute kidney disease. I broke my nose, I had impetigo, I had other kind of skin rashes, and I broke two fingers. In other words, it was just a typical miserable male adolescence with bonus illnesses because of my breathing. So let's flash forward to I've graduated from dental school. We've been married for a couple of years. We got our wedding gifts. We've moved to Shreveport. I started practicing with my daddy. We started raising some beautiful kids. We go on a family vacation. And by then, my weight looks pretty good because now I've got Crohn's disease. Yeah, I've got diarrhea all the time, got abdominal pain all the time, I'm uncomfortable all the time, and I can't gain weight because I'm sick, chronic inflammatory disease. And you can see I've got that posture related to my breathing. Those are compensations for breathing. You can really see it there. There's a sick young man with Crohn's disease trying to breathe. <clears throat> developing that hump that got worse and worse in my back as I got older, even when I was trying to relax. So we had these two wonderful children. And during these years, played a lot of music in our band and the weight went up and down. Well, who here now? Here I'm, I'm skinny. Uh, I'm playing the guitar on the Delta Queen riverboat going down to Mississippi. And I got to play for B.B. King himself who autographed my guitar. And I'm skinny and I'm skinny because I just got out of the hospital from having a foot of my gut taken out from Crohn's disease. And finally started getting better, started gaining some weight again. And then as I get up into my 40s, 50s, and 60s, eh, the weight gain is still there. I'm still a sick old man. Still got Crohn's disease going on. Got this bad posture. Got my head and shoulders forward. And by the time I'm 60 years old, sitting with my good friend, Corky Carnahan from San Antonio, who we were getting ready to pass off as a German luncheon speaker during my presidential year at the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. There I am, 60 years old. So there's 25 to 60, not a good time. I mean, a lot of good time in my life, but I was sick the whole time. And there you can see I look sick. And during those particular years, I had a lot of skin problems. I had two blood clots in my legs due to the Crohn's disease. Also had an ileocolectomy for obstruction and fistula, some other surgeries, and was almost put out of business frequently because I had so much lower back pain that I couldn't even function, and much, much more. So leading up to the point where I treated myself, this is my history. Childhood allergies, chronic sinus infections, wasn't breastfed, daily antihistamines at age five, eczema, impetigo, began journey to 300 pounds at age eight, anxiety and depression and suicidal tendencies through my entire childhood and adulthood. I was just really unhappy. Acute kidney disease at 13, hit 300 pounds at 18, Diagnosed with Crohn's disease at 29, two deep venous thromboses with hospitalization, two rectal fissurotomies, which did not cure the problem. It got worse and worse. I was on experimental medicine that was destroying my white blood cells until my sister actually got me through that crisis by treating me with acupuncture. Acupuncture actually kept me from dying at that point. 
So maybe we shouldn't indulge in contempt before investigation. She saved my life back then. I had this resection of my ileum and colon. I had high blood pressure. I was diagnosed with cardiomyopathy with an enlarged left ventricle. My ejection fraction was in the 20s. I had, didn't have obstructive sleep apnea, but I was a mouth breather that gave me central apnea. And in the 1990s, I had a stroke. I woke up and couldn't move my left hand. Uh, it almost put me completely out of business until I got the basic functions of my left hand back. I had atrial fibrillation, failed three times to, to convert it. So I had my AV, AV node ablated twice and have had, I'm on my second pacemaker and defibrillator over eight years. Uh, I'm still in permanent AFib, but I don't have symptoms of it. <clears throat> as far as the Crohn's disease, <clears throat> I had persistent abdominal tenderness. Not only did I feel bad down there, if you put any pressure on my abdomen, it really hurt. I had a terrible time maintaining my weight. I had palmar psoriasis in which the skin on the tips of my fingers and the palm of, palm of my hands would desquamate all down to the subdermis, requiring injections of uh, cortisone into those lesions, which is not fun. I had dyshydrosis in which I would sweat under my skin on my hands. My hands would swell up and itch terribly as if I had poison ivy. On my legs, I had these really hideous Schomburg's purple eye for only over 30 years that wouldn't go away no matter what I did. And had an uh, exacerbation of what's called pyoderma gangrenosum, which means you got gangrene in the skin that is oozing pus. Great stuff. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And also during the time I developed advanced heart failure. All of this before I took Mark Cruz's course and really nothing was helping. That's what pyoderma gangrenosa looks like. So that's what I went through from age three to 68 probably wasn't gonna to live too long. But in 2013, I heard Mark Cruz and I heard Ted Belfour. And Ted talked about homie blocks. I took Mark Connecting the Dots courses. <clears throat> and I realized it, 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 at that time that I was that patient. My health issues were related to a lifetime of dysfunctional breathing, chewing and swallowing. I had poor tongue function and tongue posture and didn't have enough room for my tongue and my nose wasn't developed correctly and none of it worked right together. And then Ted showed these cases with homie blocks where he was growing faces and airways in adults. I thought it was preposterous, although he had photographs and cone beam CT scans that showed it apparently worked. So there's no way that can work or is it? I mean, it might be worth a try. I'm a sick guy, nothing else has helped. Let's give this a try. We should not indulge in contempt before investigation. <coughs> I was gonna wear my homeo blocks every night with my mouth taped shut. I was gonna spray out my nose with saline to make sure I could breathe through it and then crank my narrow nostrils open with breathing right strips at night. I was gonna adjust those homeo blocks a half a turn every week. And we were gonna make, get Sanders Graff was gonna make photographs before we started and every three months until we either gave up or thought we were through treating. We also made a cone beam CT scan before treatment, planning to make one after treatment. And I took impressions of my dental arches every three months to coincide with the photographs we were taking to see if we could see any correlation. I was gonna work during the daytime to retrain my tongue. During the day with my lips closed and my tongue in my palate where it belongs. I was gonna to try to learn to chew better because I ate too fast. I was gonna to try to learn to swallow correctly because my swallowing was so poor during the lack of Train, you, we deal with two kinds of tongues. We've got restricted tongues that just can't do what they're supposed to do. And then we've got dumb tongues 
which could have done it if they had been taught. And I had a dumb tongue that had to be taught how to work. And my swallowing was so bad that I had to inhale air to get the bolus of food down my throat. I was going to try to learn to stand up straight. A bunch of exercises and stretching positions that I can't show here so that I could try to correct my posture over and over during the daytime until as my structure function and behavior improved, it might become uh, the default, default posture. And I really didn't expect much to happen because everybody told me this wasn't going to work. I mean, after all, you can't grow bone at age 68, can you? Bone growth of the CRFC stops at age 25, doesn't it? So these were the homeoblocks. I wore them from January 2014 to August 2015. Here's me at night before I go to bed. Got the homeoblocks in, got my nose sprayed with saline, got tape on my mouth, got breathe right strips to crank my mouth open. Crank my, let me try that again, to keep my nose open. These are the homeoblocks. I don't really have time to explain that. That'll be a whole other course. But as you can see, they have expander mechanisms in them. But the idea is to not suddenly crank the teeth apart. The idea is to use light intermittent pressure with these finger springs and these bite blocks to turn stem cell growth back on to initiate sutural growth so that the dental arches themselves actually turn the interrupted growth back on and take the teeth along for the ride. <clears throat> that's the concept and apparently that's what they're doing. We'll see. So to start with, here's my sick and tired old head. If you look at that green line, that should be about 97 millimeters. And in my case, it's underdeveloped nine millimeters. In other words, my maxilla is almost two centimeters further back in my face than it should be. Not creating much room for my tongue. And you can see the tongue is down low in my mouth, or it should be up and forward in the roof of my mouth. And had it been up and forward, and not in this low tongue posture, and maybe that obvious site of obstruction right there wouldn't be there. So how are we going to document these changes? This is from Karen Bonnick's wonderful article of thousands of English school children who were mouth breathers and snorers. And they did a facial analysis, analysis to see which parts of their CRFCs or deficient in kids with these habits. And it makes sense. If you look at the color figure there of a face, the areas in green are the areas that will not develop both frontally and all three dimensions unless the tongue comes up and forward and develops the maxilla and the basocranium and the airway and all of those structures. So if they're snoring and the tongue's down low, these, and that's me, then the, that part of the face is not going to be developed. <clears throat> so we took my preoperative and postoperative photographs, and if you look at all the little, little points over here on the left side, all these different anatomic points with the forehead, the brow, the eyes, the nose, the ala, the maxilla, the lips, and the chin, what I did was to use a simple morphing software called Abrosoft Phantomorph, take the before and after photographs, use those same reference points, and put them into a movie just to see if anything had changed. So to give you an idea of what that morphing software looks like, <clears throat> here is a photograph of me from about 20 years before then, morphing into this, showing me getting about 15, 20 years older and sicker. Kind of losing the smile. A lot of things going bad with facial color. Ooh, just really don't look that good. So that shows the change over 15 years. Now, I had hoped that this is what would happen. Actually, this is a joke. I was just hoping that things would get better. 
I really didn't want to look like Tom Cruise. Uh, that would have been kind of silly. Plus, he's got breathing problems worse than mine. So when we put together the before and after photographs, here's what actually happened over a year and a half as I got older. Here I am getting a year and a half older. Here I am, well, it looks like I'm getting older and sicker there, but wait a minute, this is backwards. I'm not getting older, it looks like I'm getting younger. Wait a minute, the facial color is different. <coughs> Everything around the eyes is different. There's the heads coming up and forward. The facial symmetry is changing. Everything looks a whole lot different. I was pretty astounded when I saw that. And it, that's a pretty good difference. So that gives me hope that, uh, yeah, I think this might have helped some. If you look at the side, my chin position's changing, my head position's changing, the upper lip's filling out a little bit, circles under my eyes are getting better, the bridge of my nose is getting wild, wider, my ear looks like it's moving in position. But if you look in front of my ear, the most dramatic thing is, you can see my sphenoid bone growing. My face is growing in all three dimensions. I'm developing my basal cranium. How the hell can you do that at age 68? And if we look in the mouth, you can see the changes that are going on within the palate itself. And you can see that these teeth with these casts, I made all these restorations myself, except for two made by my good friend, Joe Beard. Gold is still the best we got. But it, it appears that the teeth are kind of uprighting themselves. They're not being tipped out. They're uprighting themselves in the bone as the bone expands and takes the teeth along with it. And maybe it's changing the nasal capsule up above it. If the palate's changing that much, then maybe the things above it are changing too. And down below, there's stuff going on in the maxilla too. Tongue position is changing as it's coming up and forward. It looks like the teeth are uprighting in the bone as the maxilla come, appears to be coming forward on the left side. Did all of that happen? Well, it did in these movies. So if you look at my oropharyngeal airway, this is Dr. Belfort. These slides I'm gonna show now, he took the Comey CT scans, put them through the Mayo Clinic Analyze 10 software. This is a virtual pharyngioscopy. We're looking at, let me get my pointer. We're looking at this area at the base of my tongue and my soft palate. <clears throat> this is the base of my tongue. This is the back of my throat. This is the outline of my pinch point, my starling resistor, the area that's the most likely to collapse. And that's before the homing blocks. Well, did that change any? Well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't look like night and day, but if you look over here on the right side, this airway looks a lot more open than this one. We can see the tongue has moved up and forward, which has helped that happen. And if we look at the shape of my starling resistor, my pinch point, it's bigger. Now you may say, well, that's not that much bigger, but let's think about Poizui's law and Bernoulli's law. If you increase the lumen of a tube by four millimeters, it has a positive effect on laminar flow, pressure and airflow is if you increased it by 16 millimeters. Now that's pretty astounding. So what appears to be a minimal increase in the worst place in my airway is actually a hell of a big increase. So yes, size matters, but it really may not matter that much at the pinch point, especially if you can tone the airway so it doesn't collapse. And especially if you can learn to breathe silently and slowly so that the airflow is reduced and things just don't want to collapse to start with. Structure, function, and behavior. There's a structural change. 
So if you look at the cone beam CT scan, you can see a change in the tongue position. The airway looks a little better defined. It's obviously bigger. And interestingly, stop that. If you look up here at the frontal sinuses, and I've tried to make pretty much the same cut through here, those frontal sinuses look bigger. Well, what about disuse atrophy? If I've never been breathing through my nose, we know that mouth breathers lose their sense of smell and to a degree their sense of taste because if you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you lose it. So is it possible that while we were regrowing these structures, that by also harnessing the production of nitric oxide by nasal breathing, that I actually grew a bigger airway, a bigger frontal sinus? It's possible. I don't know. This is just things we can see. And if we look at that same software here, <clears throat> the original bone you see is what I started out with, and it's in green. Everything that's either changed position or has grown new bone is in red, and there's a lot of it there. There has been significant change. If you look at it from the front, facial symmetry has gotten better because Again, we saw the growth of the sphenoid on the right side, but also the internal part of it. So it actually increased uh, the size of my nasal airway in the, in the medial portion. We were hoping the maxilla would grow bigger, which it did, which grows you a bigger airway, better cheekbones. The mandible grew forward and the, there was healing on the left side. Remember the left side of my face is what was so underdeveloped. And the sphenoid bone on that side had really grown too. So that significant osteogenesis in an old fart is borne out by comparative CBCTs. This is a, a slide from Dr. Simonetti. He says, the genome has a master plan, but our phenotype is based on changing environmental conditions and inputs. So we saw the environmental conditions that created deficiencies in my face, in my genotype, in my phenotype. And we also saw the changes that we were able to create by reinstituting growth. So that Marcotte mask is based on Fibonacci's golden mean ratio, a relationship of shape that occurs over and over and over again in nature in items that are perceived to be healthful in beauty. And the key to it is symmetry. Nature wants symmetry. Everybody you'll see with these problems has asymmetry in the growth of their CRFCs. If we can correct that asymmetry, we better may be helping them with structure, function, and behavior. Our genome wants symmetry. So how is our phenotype determined? Well, genetically and epigenetically. And then if it doesn't happen correctly, the problem with epigenetically is that you may have had parents who were perfect in every way, but they didn't breastfeed you and you ate all the wrong foods and you developed all these problems and negative characteristics and it changes the expression of your DNA so you pass it on to the next generation. Those are the things that Weston Price was showing in the last century. Those are the things we're talking about here today. So let's look at facial symmetry, 2013, 2015. Face is much more symmetrical. I'm a hell of a lot healthier. And it's measurable. Here you can see measurement of growth of the sphenoid and measurement in the change in my, in my mandible. The frontal process of the maxilla had widened here and that definitely improves breathing. That's really all I thought we were going to get, is to grow a bigger maxilla and so I could get air in and out better while moving my tongue up and forward. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, left TM joint, which was the one where I had problems, when you superimpose the cone beam CT scans, red shows where I actually grew new bone in my glenoid fossa and in the head of the condyle itself and recaptured the disc that had been out of place and created clicking for decades. I no longer have any pain or dysfunction. 
as that joint healed itself as the mandible grew down and forward. Here's a superimposition of my nasal capsule animation. And you can draw your own conclusions from that. But my friend Jeff Rouse says, just do the dentistry, don't think about the medicine. To me, that's not just the dentistry. We're using dental techniques in the mouth, but it's also growing the face and the airway. That somehow is beyond dentistry. And as you look at these slow pictures of my eyes healing, remember that the face is just a mask that's hung on the, on the bone. The tissue is the issue, but the bone sets the tone. And that face is changing because all those areas in red went through osteogenesis to create better structure function and behavior and a better flat platform on which to hang what's left of my 75 year old face. If you look, these are the purpura I had on my ankles for over 30 years. I couldn't do anything to get them to go away. I would put cortisone cream on it, wrap my legs in saran wrap, nothing, nothing, nothing topically would help it. But after wearing the homie blocks and doing this procedure for a year and a half, in 2016, that's what these skin lesions look like, and now they're completely healed. Draw your own conclusions from that. Those other problems with skin peeling off my hands, all those other skin problems, none of them have recurred. No type of skin allergies at all after they're plaguing me my entire lifetime. So what other measurable changes happened? Well, I went from 242 pounds to 195 pounds without dieting. And five or six, seven years later, I still weigh 195 pounds and I eat whatever I want. I think it's because I've learned to not only to breathe, but to chew and swallow correctly. And I now have shut off the shit storm of dysautonomia, uh, which promotes weight gain. And I think I got my leptin and ghrelin under control and I'm not releasing cortisol because cortisol keeps you fat whether you eat or not. So I think it's basically created uh, a set of uh, autonomia in my, in, in my autonomic nervous system. My weight is still stable. I'm on my second pacemaker that holds me down to 70, but my pulse stays in the 60s now. I don't take antihypertensive medicines anymore. All my abdominal tenderness and diarrhea from Crohn's disease is gone unless I really push myself too hard or eat the wrong food, but I don't have any daily problems. <clears throat> All of my chronic skin problems are gone. And now I habitually breathe through my nose to my diaphragm during the daytime and at night. Although it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, my wife will say, Hey, you're breathing through your mouth. And so I have to make those corrections. But it takes work. None of this automatically happens. It takes work. Now I sleep just great at night, and all I have to do is tape my mouth. Occasionally I wear my pod. I really haven't figured out if it's necessary, but it makes sense because it gives me more room for my tongue, and I don't think it can do any damage. <clears throat> I've been successfully off of Paxil for a, a month now. Uh, which is wonderful. And I'm trying to get off of uh, proton pump inhibitors for GERD, but uh, that's still a work in progress. My ejection fraction initially got way up uh, seven or eight years ago, but I've got congestive heart failure. It's back down again. It's really hard to reverse advanced heart failure. But despite the fact that I should feel sick, I feel great. I feel as well as any old far to 75 has a right to feel. So that's the story of what I've learned in dentistry, what I've learned in airway, what we finally did to try to help treat me. Uh, it's a hell of a story, to me at least. Simonetti explains it when homeostasis with the four elements is obtained, coupled with the proper mechanical forces. The epigenome receives an environmental stimulus that can activate hidden genes and stimulate the rejuvenators of life, the endogenous stem cell. So 
On the left, we tried to create the proper mechanical force. And if we think about Leonardo's symmetrical man with fig leaf, I think that's what's happened. I think this has saved my life. And having lived this, I thought, what the hell? Can we help other people with this? Is this just what they call an accident? What they call an anecdotal information? Well, I tell you what, if you're feeling a hell of a lot better, you don't care if it's anecdotal or not, it's personal. So that's the end of part one, thank you. Thank you for hanging with me. The next two videos are going to recover, are going to cover what are we doing now as a team to help walk our patients towards wellness? How do we apply all those things that I just explained that we think we know? How do we get this sick? How do we all get in this mess? What are the causes? How must, me as, must we as health professionals look at our patients better to understand their issues? What details have we missed in the past in our diagnostic records? What can we do as a team to affect a cure? We will show numerous patient stories and documentable, result, documentable results. And we'll show results using some of these devices along with OMT and Buteco training and various patient training aids. We'll discuss all of this stuff. Remember today's take home thought. It's all about the tongue and the nose. And until recently, we weren't considering nasal breathing, just breathing. It's what we breathe through and how we breathe that counts. Well, now we're looking at a blue screen. And now we're not sharing the screen anymore. That's the first time I ever tried to do a video. I've done a lot of standing up talking to groups before. Uh, for an old man to try to learn how to work this software, this is yet another challenge. Uh, again, I was asked to do this. That's, that's why I've done this. And I wasn't asked just to show some patients. I was asked to tell stories. And I hope uh, that you'll find this long, boring story somewhat more than long and boring. And it might have some application as to what you do uh, for yourselves, your friends, your patients. And I really thank you for your indulgence. It's been a pleasure to do this, and I pray to God it recorded. We'll see you in part two.